who stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do I have a motion to approve tonight's agenda? Mr. President, I move that the board approve the May 8th, 2023 agenda. Motion made and seconded. Motion passes. Next, we'll have report of the board members. If any. Yeah. Natalie. Okay, I'm gonna try to make this fast. So um, just a couple of quick shout outs. I attended uh, Raytown High School's Into the Woods. It was exceptional as always. And then I got to take a sneak peek at the end of the talent show sponsored by Stu Co. And I wanna say it was April that won. She danced to the Eurythmics. Uh, and then today I got the pleasure of touring several schools, um, Eastwood Hills, uh, looking at their community space fourth grade PE, a kindergarten reading instruction, uh, where they really emphasize phonemic awareness with our new curriculum, uh, second grade math class where they were learning how to count to uh, $1 and really uh, love their, I call it like an art parade where every single kid had an art piece and it was just like walking through an entire wing. Uh, I went to Laurel Hills Elementary uh, where I observed the kindergarten class, second grade reading with small group in independent instruction, and then a third grade class where they were learning about space after doing some research. And then I was able to see the fantastic library upgrade, which was passed through a bond, the past one. Um, then I went to the Northwood School um, and really uh, took a look at their programs, uh, visited a daily living skills classroom, which was also upgraded through one of the bonds, a uh, music class where they're going to be working on Ameri like an American Idol, but Northwood Idol contest, uh, recreational therapy class, uh, reading and math intensive instruction class, reading comprehension, and then observe how they do movement, brain breaks, and calm down spaces. Uh, and then I saw a lot more one-on-one -on -one instruction with kindergartens learning how to match emotions. And then I visited the staff calm down room. <laughs> that was nice. Um, at Raytown High School, I got to catch up with yours truly. He's right there, wave your hand. <laughs> and just to do a little check-in and then Westwood Elementary, second graders were learning parts of a graph and an interactive lesson in kindergarten class. They were studying about animal habitats. Uh, and then my last tour of the day was at Raytown Middle uh, in a project lead the way class. They had just, everybody was finishing up some things with mapping um, and uh, two eighth grade classes where they were reading To Kill a Mockingbird um, and researching different components connected to topics in the book. And I was uh, in part of a scaffolded discussion uh, to build their reading comprehension. Um, and then just my own news, I just got back from DC and I was announced one of the national teachers of the year for the NEA Foundation. That's it. Anyone else? Um, hello. hello. I got to uh, attend the Sparkle Conference. It was wonderful. And I got to sit at the table with the kids. I didn't want to sit with the old folks. I sat at the table with the kids. It was uh, highly informative. A lot of mental health stuff going on, self-esteem stuff. Thank you to our superintendent who put that on. Also this week, I got to go to the mayor's prayer breakfast uh, where a lot of the board members were there and they were the whole group praying for all the leadership of Raytown. We need prayer. <laughs> I don't know if you don't, I need prayer. All right, those are the things that I've got a chance to do. 
Anyone else? Well, first of all, Natalie is probably being an understatement on her awards there, so we probably should put out a press release on that because it's a pretty big deal, that thing that Natalie won. So we're pretty pretty excited about that. Uh, just a couple things. Repeat what Natalie said. Into the Woods was a fantastic production at Raytown High School. It's such a difficult, difficult show to put on, and they did a fantastic job. Proud of all those kids and the staff that helped put that on. Got to go to the Cinder Experience, which was a fundraiser for REF, and it was just fantastic in our new culinary space. And the kids over there did a great job, as always, and just a full house. And so hope, I think it was a successful event for you guys. Good. And then another thing that REF was involved in, went to the youth baseball, the brand new one here in Raytown. They're starting up. Dave Patterson is the lead on that. And and REF is very important in helping our kids be able to be a part of that. And this great new league that's going to hopefully help a lot of our kids play baseball. And then popped into a Ray team meeting and like to like to surprise them once in a while, keep them on their toes, but love the collaboration in Ray team. So ready to hear your report tonight. I attended um, also the Sparkle Conference, and uh, I took some sparkles home. I got it, so I got it. It was it was really it was really outstanding, and uh, look forward to uh, the expansion of uh, whatever the other one be called. Um, and so also into the woods, enjoyed that a lot. Um, so I appreciate the reports to the board members and. I think that's it for information on that. Let's move on. Board of Superintendents. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman Burton, Vice Chairman Watson, members of the Raytown Quality School District Board, and members of the community. At this time, I'd like to bring your attention to items 8.6. Mr. Gibson, would you please come forward to present information as it pertains to the annual employee on-site clinic review? Yeah, you should be good. You're good, Mr. Gibson. Sorry. Uh, good evening, members of the board, uh, Dr. Martin Knox. Um, I'm here to introduce uh, Miss Erin Eason. Uh, she is with CBiz, and CBiz is the company that we work with uh, in helping to manage our health clinic. And so uh, she does an annual report to let you know kind of its performance, how, how things have gone. Um, and I think she has some good news to share. So, um, Ms. Erin Eason. I don't know if they're gonna pull it up. Do you all have it in front of? You can go ahead and start. We do go that. ahead and start. Okay. Well, it's nice to meet everyone. Thank you so much for having uh, me today to talk a little bit about the performance of our seventh year with the Raytown Quality Care Clinic. So this is um, an offering that all employees who are enrolled in the health plan, as well as their spouses and dependents have access to. Um, and so uh, on an annual basis, really on a weekly and sometimes monthly basis as well, we look at what the performances, make sure that we're engaging people in the way that we hope to. And if we aren't, uh, make some adjustments. But thankfully, this has been a really nice um, service for uh, your staff for many years. So I'll spend a little time talking about um, what we've done over the last seven years and then dig into the details around the performance in year seven. So if you wanna, there you go. So I'm not gonna go through all of this. The, the health clinic has evolved as the needs of the population have evolved. So while we opened um, with a physician run clinic that dispenses medications, uh, treats people for acute needs, chronic condition needs, 
Um, we've evolved since then and added physical therapy, uh, both that's, that uh, helps to treat occupational-based injuries as well as personal health injuries. Um, we have added a behavioral health counselor that sees people for um, stressors in their lives. We've incorporated virtual care and a home medication delivery program just to meet the needs of the population, um, while also uh, the goal being to control health care costs. So a lot has happened over the last seven years. In this last year of um, the health center, we saw over a thousand individuals. So 1,013 primarily employees were seen for personal health needs. We had over 4,700 appointments kept and just over 4,400, I'm sorry, scheduled and just over 4,400 kept. So the majority, large majority of appointments are kept. 25% um, were virtual by phone or by video. And that's been an important enhancement. It was obviously very important um, in the midst of the pandemic, but it's continued to allow staff who are um, not ready or able to leave their classrooms or their schools um, still access the care that they need uh, during their, their work day. And so it's been heavily utilized. It's also reduced our no-show rates, which is a really important statistic that we track to ensure that we're optimizing uh, the staff that are in the health center. 43% of appointments were either preventive or for management of chronic conditions. So while we are happy to help folks with acute conditions like strep or ear infections, our goal is to um, help uh, build overall health and well-being. And so to do that, our providers really focus on the underlying conditions um, that folks might have. There were an average of 4.4 visits for, per patient overall. We dispensed over 2,300 medications on site. We carry what's called a dispensary. It contains about um, 100 common medications, all generic, um, anything from an antibiotic to a blood pressure medication. No narcotics, no brand names are carried in the health center. And then another 2,000 medications were dispensed through the clinic home delivery program, which is incredibly successful. Um, that allows us to uh, perform medication refills from within the health center without utilizing a provider visit, which opens our provider's time to see patients, um, which was really important for us as we were reaching our capacity. So we were able to add a service without having to add expensive provider hours, which has been a really nice benefit. Behavioral health, we had 415 appointments scheduled, 380 of those were kept, and we had 97 unique behavioral health patients in 2022. That's important. Um, because we had a fairly large span of time over six months where we were recruiting for another um, counselor. So that really happened within um, six months. We saw 100 people for behavioral health needs. As we know, that's a pressing need of the entire community um, and nationally a, a great need. So to be able to reach those folks was really powerful. And 89 total health coaching appointments were, were kept. That's um, a virtual service that Premise, who actually runs the health center, offers. And then finally, we had 166 uh, PT appointments scheduled, 160 of those were kept, and saw 37 unique patients. So they're being seen for um, somewhere in the neighborhood of four to five visits per issue. Patient satisfaction uh, continues to be one of the best in my book of business. Um, we see uh, these, these are post-visit surveys that people are offered after their visit. They're asked if they want to provide feedback. If they do. This is what we get. Um, we had nearly 100%. You can see down the board uh, rated their services as good or excellent. 99.8 indicated their privacy was well maintained. That's something that's very um, important to us to focus on as an employer-based health center. 99.7 indicated they would recommend this health center to others, their peers. 97.6 folks waited less than 10 minutes. Over 90% waited less than five minutes. I'd encourage you all to remember the last time you went to a community provider and waited less than five minutes for the provider to walk in the door. That's what this is. Um, and 99.7 folks, uh, percent of folks indicated they were either likely or very likely to um, return. The word cloud to the right, um, takes the free text comments that people have provided and makes the things that are repeated more larger. Um, and so you can see uh, very care, love, always doctor. And then if you look really hard, you'll see every um, staff person's name 
That's not us picking and choosing. That's just based on what people say. And I'm not gonna read the next slide to you other than a couple of comments. Um, these are co folks who uh, responded in the survey that they were willing to share their feedback. So we asked that question to make sure that we're maintaining their privacy. Um, so I'm just gonna read a couple of these. As always, the staff shows that they care about you and your well-being. The most genuine doctor and staff I have dealt with in my 60 years on this planet. They always answer any questions I have with a complete factual with complete factual answers and always with a smile. I'm beyond grateful that behavioral health has been added as a service. I believe a short course of treatment will not only be beneficial for my health, but will enable me to support those I supervise more effectively. Grace upon grace. And then a call out for our wonderful health center manager. Megan is wonderful. I wish all healthcare was, was set up like this clinic, professional staff, easy scheduling, although sometimes it's difficult to find an open appointment and 20 minutes or more for appointments means no waiting. So thank you. So finding appointments is something we monitor. We, and we are, our goal is same day, next day, but um, there are times where utilization flexes up and we have to figure out how to respond to that. But that's why we monitor on a, a weekly basis. So the last thing I just wanna share with you is some estimated employee savings. These are fairly conservative numbers, assuming that a person, instead of going to a clinic, would have gone to a primary care office in the community, um, where we know that oftentimes folks go to urgent care, minute clinics, and even the ER um, when they aren't able to get into their own provider's office, assuming they have one. So uh, we assume $114 per paid office visit, um, and the cost of a health center of the health center visit is thirty dollars, thirty five dollars for a PPO plan um, member, and then virtual visits because they were free during the emergency period are not included in these savings. So based on that, um, in one year, employees saved um, a, a total of just shy of one hundred and eighteen thousand dollars on pharmacy uh, costs. That's assuming the lowest pharmacy tier would have been $12 in the um, in the community, $4,100. So just over $120,000 in, in this is employee savings. So dollars in their pockets. And then since it opened in August of 2015, we've seen over $770,000 of employee savings. We've measured return on investment for many, many years, but as you kind of tip over into the health center being your becoming your baseline, which we are at a seven year period, we agreed to monitor utilization, ensure that it man, maintained or continued to grow, which it has um, versus looking at district savings, though the health plan has been performing um, really beautifully over the last couple of years. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. No questions, just great, great job. Thank you for the report. It just uh, makes me jealous that I'm not able to partake of that. I, I, uh, I echo that. There are many days that I <laughs> wish I could come. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. At this time, I'd ask your attention to be drawn to article or item number 8.7, Dr. Greiner. Uh, for him to present strategic planning update with G and D Associates. I thought I saw Scott. Hey, Scott. Good evening, Dr. Martin Knox, President Burton, Vice President Watson, members of the board. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce Scott Fuller in person. Uh, some of you may have remembered Scott from his virtual visit with us back in the fall. Scott is in district this week, working with a representative team on strategic planning. We thought with some of the changes on the board, uh, it'd be a great opportunity to provide an update on some of the work that's happened until now with strategic planning, as well as a look ahead to what we can expect in the next few months. So we're grateful for the partnership with GND, and I'll invite Scott to join you and provide some information and answer any questions you might have. Scott? Good evening, board members. Dr. Martin Knox. Dr. Reiner, thank you. Um, pleasure to be here in district, and I, it's always more fun to be here not on a screen and trying to figure out what everybody's thinking and uh, just be, make it more personal. And I'm glad to see new faces on the board and happy to update you on uh, where we are in the process and what's coming next and then take some questions, obviously. 
Um, first, just a little bit about us, who I am and who our company is. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, we're a Colorado-based company that's worked in over 36 states across the country, supporting people with um, everything from visioning and strategic planning to communication supports to um, instructional practice coaching and executive coaching. Uh, we've been at it for well over a decade and we're all former educators and administrators who have done this work. Um, we don't do anything that's canned. So what we really hang our hat on is getting to know who we're working with and really get in as partners so that we actually can tailor everything we do to your needs, the needs of your community and your context. Certainly we have structures around change management and how we organize strategic plans. But one of the one of the ideas we've put forward to your representative group is that everything there needs to be you. We're not here to push an agenda. We're not here to tell you what your context should be. We're thought partners and we provide structures to enable you to set a vision of where you want to be over the next three to five years and actually be able to achieve that through really um, proven change management structures. So I'd love to just spend a little bit of time talking about how we do that and, and where we are in the process. And we start with this model, and this is really how our company is built, but also how our systems are built and all of our structures around strategic planning. And it's, it's, a, it's a change management model, and I know there's plenty out there, um, but for education, this one has made a lot of sense. It was developed by an educator, actually. And so what this model says, the Nostra model, is that to get to achieve any sort of change or evolution that you're looking for as an organization, you really need five components to be in, the pl in place. The first and the one we'll talk the most about tonight is a vision. And when we talk about vision, we go beyond the vision statements that you see many places have a statement and some bullet points that are really aspirational and good things but we don't believe they really paint the picture of who you are and what you're trying to do. And to truly get to where you're trying to go, we believe you have to manage it. You have to imagine it in detail. So we talk about a comprehensive vision and that's comprised of um, several narratives, which I'll get into in a little bit. So not only having that vision, the, having that vision is just the first step. It needs to be commonly understood and bought into not only internally, but externally from your wider community, everybody from your students to retirees, to people new to the community that may not even have students in your district yet. So this is really about community investment and community onboarding to a vision, which um, is a continual process that really never ends. And certainly we provide recommendations and structures for that as well. Once that vision is in place, it's important to then say, okay, how do we make it actionable? It's nice to have really aspirational statements. And it's what we talk about as hard change versus soft change. The soft change and the fun part is really imagining where we wanna go, getting excited about that. The hard change is what I'm putting your representative group through over the next two days, which is we have to get really detailed about how that's gonna look, how we're gonna pull it off what that means for your district in the content within the context of your district. So we do a lot of, we have a really, a lot of really good conversations about where we are, what strengths we should be leveraging, what successes we should be leveraging. And then what basically we break it down is what needs to start, what needs to stop and what needs to continue to get to the levels of success we're looking for. Past that, and I'll be really quick here is Noster says that in order to achieve that change and, and deliver on that action plan, you need to be mindful of the skills that the people have in your community, in your district. Do they have the skills needed to pull that off? And if not, how will we attend to that and build capacity across your entire district and community? Resources, what resources need to be in place, inclusive of time, being realistic about timeframes for when we implement new initiatives being really mindful about embedding time in. So we're not asking people to tack on or add 10 to 20 more hours under their workday to make this happen. This can't really be a bolt on. It has to be true transformation and what we're trying to do. So that changes some working habits as well. And then finally, incentives. 
why should people get on board? What's in it for them? And that's not always dollars. And in fact, we dollars, although it comes up, is not the number one incentive people have. People want to know that the work we're doing is community connected, that they want to, they want to see that, hey, this is going to, we're planting seeds for years to come through this work. Even if we don't see the fruit tomorrow, we will and generations ahead of us potentially will see it as well. So this is what we base everything off of. Now the vision structure we use, and you have a copy of, um, and you'll get a link to a, a Google doc where you can leave some feedback. Uh, you have a copy of some vision narratives and there's five different narratives. We also have the branded version of that. And this is all in draft form because we wanna make sure you have inputs to this and provide feedback in the process. Um, but the vision structure is we break it down into five narrative sets. One is for learning. What do we want learning to look like in the district? What does the teaching need to look like to support those learning models in the district? What does our, what do our leadership structures need to be in order to deliver on this type of thing? But also how do we develop the leadership in this district? So it's sustainable beyond any one or two people. Pivot culture is one of the most dangerous things to a, a community in a school district. So visions and strategic plans have to be larger than one person or two people. And so our structures help set up that sustainability and are really mindful about that. What professional learning do we need to engage in? And then finally, how do we interact with our wider community over the life of this vision and bring them in as true partners in the work that we're doing? So how did we get to these draft vision statements? Well, several inputs. And first, we always start with learning about your district and having several conversations over many weeks. But you know, one of the things we learned was there was already, given the fact that Dr. Martin Knox had come into the district new and she had her plan for coming in and how to engage the community and doing a lot of listening tours and, and onboarding so that people, just so that you all understood what the needs were and, and what her charge was coming in. So we absolutely had conversations around that. We know there are internal surveys that happen. So any data we can glean from that. Classic things like performance measures, where we are and what data is important to us and what we look at, what initiatives you have in play right now. Um, because again, this isn't about throwing out baby with the bathwater. This is looking to see, okay, what are the types of things we need to con continue and then finally our facilitated community engagement work which really fell into two categories one we um, put out an online we co-developed and put out an online survey um, and then we came in we used that survey really to drive the development of questions for face-to-face -face focus groups with several members of your community and this is just a very high level breakdown of who we talk to we talked to 46 students throughout your district, face-to-face, -face, really about eight to 10 at a time, and had some really good hour, sometimes even plus. I don't know if they were trying to get out of class longer or whether they were just really interested, but I can tell you the information we got, they seemed really interested. So um, it, it's a process we encourage you to continue, um, whether it's around a vision or strategic plan or not. The students not only enjoyed it, but they give amazing insights about direction. Um, 582 parents and community members. And again, we had we had a great group of community members in this very room that I think uh, we kept Dr. Greiner here fairly late one evening and actually had about a two hour conversation with that group. Uh, really informative, great representation. 229 of your staff members. And that was inclusive of all departments, um, certified classified staff. Uh, so we, we talked to as many people as we could from facilities and maintenance to transportation, to our secretaries and educational support personnel, and then obviously our teachers. Um, Dr. Greiner um, enabled us to have conversations with all of your principals uh, via Zoom, uh, because I believe we had a snow day when I was here. Um, to talk to them so we missed that day but we did we were able to make it up and then the vision development team the team that dr griner referred to which consists of 
um, six executive leadership team members. Um, Mr. Burton was able to join us for the visioning process as his schedule allowed. And then we have principal representation as well in the room, given a total of 868 members of the Raytown Quality Schools community that we were able to get input from just directly to us. So next steps, we have a draft in front of you. And I believe it's in your board packets. And um, like I said, you'll get a link and I wanna give you several options for how you do this for your own comfort level. You'll have a link to a, a Google doc with the same um, narratives and you're welcome to comment on that. You're welcome to make your own copy and comment on that and shoot it back to us. Um, if you're more comfortable just downloading what you have and even writing writing notes on it and taking pictures and sending it on to us, we're happy with that. So whatever method works best for you to give feedback and, and input onto those drafts so that we can help you all make adjustments and get the wording just right for where you want it, that'd be really helpful. Uh, ideally, that would happen in the next couple of weeks, certainly before Memorial Day would be ideal so we can continue to move forward. However, we're accommodating, it's about your timeline. So if you need more time for that, just let us know, um, not problematic. As Dr. Greiner said, we're engaged in strategic planning processes where we actually break that, those, the ideas and that vision down. And we start saying, okay, if this is what we said we're gonna do, how are we gonna do it? What are the steps and actual deliverables we need to have in place over the next three to five years to make sure it happens? And then we're moving into what are the action steps, who needs to be involved, and what are the really clear and transparent success criteria and SMART goal format, both qualitative and quantitative, so you can know what to expect is in terms of success. What does success look like? Look like, And even then we'll get into structures of how you garner support. So community engagement is one of those things that we believe should never stop. And so it's a continual process. So we recommend taking a vision and a strategic plan on tour around the community, get people into it, ask them what their hopes and hesitations are about it. Those hesitations are really helpful because they help you in how do we best communicate our work going forward? Are there tweaks and adjustments we need to make along the way? And do we just need to invest in helping people with deeper understanding about the work we're doing? Helps us with professional learning as well and in our internal community. And then getting into implementation. We have some very um, clear structures that we know work once you get into implementation, such as uh, regular health checks of each project in your strategic plan, how to come back to the board and how often to come back to the board and some um, good formats that have been successful with other boards around the country for regular reporting of the progress on a strategic plan. And then um, getting into annual plan record where we look at what we've accomplished, what we still need to work on and reprioritizing based on what we've learned. So that's actually an annual process that's meant to be flexible and grow with you as a district. If you dig into the work and continue to learn, a true plan needs to be flexible to do that. And that's what we have set up. And then finally, transparency and storytelling. How do we, how do we share windows into the work and windows into our classrooms and how a strategic plan is impacting us as a district and us as a community so that your community can truly partner on it, but also celebrate with you and help with word of mouth about the great things that are happening in this district. So I know that's quick, that's very high level. Um, with that, I'd love to open it up if you have any questions, comments. And like I said, um, my, my email address is in uh, the presentation that I think you have access to in there. Please feel free to reach out if, if you have any questions or um, if you need any support with the feedback structure on the vision draft. Now, thank you for your time. I'm excited about the work your team's doing and uh, where the community is headed. So it's good stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Moving through the agenda for item 8.8, .8, uh, Dr. Tarvin will present updates uh, pertaining to summer school. Dr. Tarvin.
Good evening, Dr. Martin Knox, I, President Burton and Vice President Watson and the rest of the members of the board. I am excited to tell you that summer school plans are well underway. We finished our first round of enrollment on Friday. As of today, we have 3,467 students enrolled. That's just slightly under 100 compared to last year. That breaks down to 40 pre-K students, 1,698 elementary students, 649 middle school students, and 1,080 high school students. So we are excited that we have this many students enrolled, and I've been telling the principals, now we just have to keep them here. So we have lots of good programming, good instruction planned for them. We will open our enrollment back up on Thursday for a second round. Um, any students who enroll from now on will be placed on wait list and put into any seats that we have available. Transportation was guaranteed through Friday. Students moving forward may or may not have transportation as seats are available as well. Um, that was really all I have for you tonight, but I wanted to check in with you, let you know where those enrollment numbers stood and see if you had any questions for me. We try to get between 40 and 50 percent of district enrollment, so we're close to that ballpark. I think after we get any other students who enroll in the next month, that we'll hit that ballpark. We welcome all students who are wanting to enroll in summer school for pre-K through eight. We've rebranded it as summer enrichment camp this year, and it, we welcome all students. We do provide title reading and math um, supports for our elementary students. We are adding reading supports for our middle school students that we have not provided in the past. So those students will get extra support as well. For high school, we offer some first time credits and we also offer some recovery credits for students who are needing to make up courses that they didn't pass the first time. Yes, our staffing is in a much better place than it was a year ago. We've had lots more staff wanting to work, and that's a great place for us to be both with students and staff. Excuse me for a sec. Board members, remember to turn on your mics. Was there a difference in any particular right level? Um, really, as I looked at the numbers this morning, those numbers are about on par with where we were a year ago at all three levels. So um, we, we are happy with how things have turned around, turned out so far in this enrollment period. What are some of those first time offerings? Um, so for high school students, they can take PE, they can take communications, wellness, um, psychology, sociology, and then most of the other courses that we offer are four classes that are credit recovery. How is staffing looking for a summer school? It, we do look like we're in a good place this year. You sure? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, I didn't hear you, sir. <laughs> I can't hear if you don't use a microphone, right? <laughs> Any other questions? I look forward to coming back to you in June and July with some pictures of the things the kids have done. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tarvin. And item 8.10, our student representatives report. <laughs> Good evening, Board of Education. Good evening, Dr. Martin Knox. If you don't know, this is my last week in school. I'm a class of 2023 senior. Thank you. Um, before I get on to what I'm about to talk about, I just wanna say thank you. I've been doing these for a little over a year. I think the first one I did was in March of last year. So I just wanna say thank you for giving me this space to talk about how I feel about my education and how I feel in my school, because I feel like it's really important to have student voice. And I'm glad that you gave me that voice. And I'm very, very appreciative of that. Um, 
in in general yes okay I'm gonna try to move quickly I have a lot on my list but just to start off I know you guys talked about Into the Woods the talent show very very good very very great we're very happy um some new things we have speech and debate national qualifiers on the Raytown side. I know you heard about the South ones, but we have some recent ones. So the speech and debate national qualifiers are me, Amaya Morgan, Toshiya Hekna, um, Sean Hewlin, Nia Vargas, and Billy Bettis will be competing in world schools debate, which we're all on like the same team. And they were taking two supplemental um, competitors, which is Chase Dernier and Rico Gross. And we are very, very happy to go. We'll go June, 10th through the 17th in Phoenix, Arizona, we'll be competing. So we're very, very excited to go. And then also, if you're not a fashion person, you should be because the entire KC Metro is talking about Raytown Prom and we cleared everybody. Yeah. And if you don't know what cleared means, go hit Urban Dictionary. <laughs> but everybody's talking about us in a good way. So I just want to say you should be very, very proud of your Raytown juniors and seniors because we ate them up. Anyways. <laughs> like <laughs> it's was was ate them up is that to the about the caterer for the prom when you said ate let's them? not talk about that one. all right okay. urban dictionary <laughs> urban dictionary go urban ahead dictionary. yeah um and then also recently we have had a meeting we usually have meetings with dr martin knox as a group in our student council in the south and we had talked about some things that maybe we should continue working on in our school specifically. And I just want to share that out. Um, some key points that we talked about is just like school culture in terms of like admin and students don't really match. And it creates a lot of friction between how the school is run. And I also think we have such a mindset on focusing on discipline that we've kind of forgotten everything else. And the discipline is very, very noticeable in Raytown High from a student standpoint of like, it feels like sometimes a student may only see their principal or their assistant principal in some way if they're getting in trouble and not in a positive light in the slightest. So it's like, it's getting to a point where it's really, really noticeable and it doesn't feel okay. And so that's something that we're looking at. And then we're also just looking at like, I think in our school, we have a really lack of collaborative space as well. So I think, that is something that can also help out the discipline aspect is just having more collaborative space, having space where teachers and staff feel on par with school culture as the students do and feeling like we're in the same space, exi existing in the same reality in the way. Um, but how do you feel? Oh, let me introduce him, sorry. Hello. <laughs> this is Aiden. The last girl that I brought last month was Eliza Soria. They are both candidates for president. We don't know who president is for next year yet. So I just brought both of them. <laughs> um, okay, going off of Amaya's point of the how like discipline is so normalized in Raytown High School. Um, ISS is a very big problem at Raytown High School. Um, and mostly for reasons that I don't feel should be that like aggressive um like there was this one kid that I knew in my geology class he got eight days ISS for being late to class because of the issues with like hall freezes and stuff and I feel like that just shows like that isn't fixing the problem that's only worsening it because just giving kids discipline for not being in class isn't going to make them want to go anyways yeah and especially giving them that long of a time. Like, I don't know how often he had ISS before. I don't know what other problems he had with the school, if he had any, but I feel like that is a very big unreasonable punishment for being late to class. And ex especially because it like, it gets in the way of like, there was this one time I was late to class and I had to attend a morning detention so I didn't have to attend ISS. And like, for me, I don't want that on my record, but the majority of the school isn't going to go. No parent is going to drive them up to the school that early in the morning. No one is going to show up for that. So it's like, you are basically, this is your only option is getting ISS because we don't really offer that many options to get out of it. And I would also like to say like, 
the way I feel like it's recognizable within students is we realized that there was a room designated for ISS on the first floor and it got moved down to our auxiliary gym because there were too many kids in ISS. And I just feel like that says enough as is. But I also feel like when it comes to that, it feels like admin and when it comes to like school culture and positivity, they only care about discipline and they don't care about the good things going on in the school. And they're focusing on ISIS, OSS, a hall freeze, detentions. Like it's like taking away our phones. Yeah. What, what, in what aspect are we cared about when we're doing good things? We're only looked at when we're doing bad things. And again, going back to the point, some of these kids only see their principals when they've done something bad. They're not seeing their principals after like a good moment or something like that, or just seeing them simply to talk to them. And that's what I think we really just got to work on. Like, obviously sending kids to ISS is not going to solve the problem of kids going to class. Like we need to find other methods to have the school culture be uplifted. And also just like discipline is important. Yes. But how can we make it to a way where students feel comfortable and safe in their school environments is I feel the most important aspect I've taken out of this entire year. But yes, also kind of a weird question. Can I take a picture with you guys? It's my last meeting. Please. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Um, you said you over the student council or you guys are part of the student council? I am currently, but I'm since I'm graduating, I'm moving out of over student council. So has the student council ever met with um, administration or teachers to address those concerns and try to work together uh, because you guys know a lot more about behavior, student behavior, because you are students. You have been late before or whatever mm -hmm. the case is. Have you ever met with administration or tried to talk to them about how it makes you feel or the inequity or the imbalance? with disciplinary uh, actions? Well, I've had conversations with admin and it's more been on of like a fault of like, what are you as student council doing? Not as what we can do together and move forward in this space, but what can you do as student council? You're like, I'm, I'm not gonna go into that, but and an aspect where it's like, you need to do better and not we need to do better, if that makes sense. Not we need to work together and do what we need to do. Cause it's, I do understand that student council has a very important part of like school culture and things like that, but it's been forced onto us in a sense where it doesn't feel like we're having fun anymore. And so I've, I have tried to have those conversations with admin but it ends up in a dead road. So I just, I decided to stop. I'm going to be honest. So Maya. We're gonna miss you. I, I'm very proud of the work you've done this year. I think. <laughs> you are the only person who can say as many words as Dr. Penelope in the same <laughs> amount. <laughs> I, you know, when we get, when we started this and we envisioned having this kind of thing. I would say you've exceeded our expectations. And I don't know if you get elected and you're going to fill, you got big shoes to fill. I do. I do. Very much. It's going to happen. So remind us one more time what your plans are after school. Gladly. I'll be attending the University of Missouri and double majoring in journalism and film. Well, thank you. Thank you for all the great reports that you've given to us this year. Thank you. So, Maya, do you have any plans to come back to Raytown? And do that you could ask me that question like five years. <laughs> I don't really know. We would love for you to come back to Raytown. We'll see you we'll back. That. We would pay it back in your community. Be back. You'll be uh, you could be the president of the United States. Okay, Amaya, I want to also uh, you too, hey. thank you. <laughs> commend, commend you as well. Um, in serving in this role, you, you've done a good service. Uh, for your students at Raytown High. Thank you. You as well. Um, I, I think what we what Rick was saying about what we envision with the having student representation, uh, I definitely that 
it's probably some of the most important things we hear. And so, um, and that's, and that is what uh, I know as a board, we want to, we desire to, to hear the student voice and to know, um, you know, us working together to improve and like, and be just built community. And so uh, I look, because of the change, because of what you've done, I think you're going to recognize a lot of change that occurs in that five years. And so I'll see you then. <laughs> yeah, get me back, cut it off because I'm about to cry. <laughs> I want to say something to you also because I really liked when you guys came on. One of the things that I was hoping for was I, you gave us a good report, but I was looking for those things that, oh, we know about, but we don't want to talk about. It. And so tonight you spoke about some things that I felt were very, very important. I love to hear the, the perspective of a student in a matter because I, as it has been stated, you got firsthand knowledge on it, whereas we're hearing it on a secondhand basis. But I really appreciate you sharing because I was looking at the report uh, of our in-school suspension and they have tremendously jumped so high. And I was glad to hear you mention about the fact that the in-school suspension and the fact that we would suspend a kid from knowledge and put him into an isolation type environment for eight days because that student was late is horrible. It is horrible. That is an injustice to a child. And so I appreciate you sharing that because we need to do better. We want to mold kids and, and develop kids. And, and we're proud of you, but we'd like to have more than just you to be proud of. We want to see all of our student base, as many as possible, achieve as much as they can in life. So I thank you for sharing that tonight. Thank you. Thank Ms. you. Mr. Maya, if I could just say one more thing about you. <laughs> when I was um, in front of the board, I'm the newest board member and I actually got voted on by the board. I mentioned you. Um, I mentioned your passion and the way you come in here and you assert yourself. And I want to pay you your flowers while you are here. This is your last meeting. Um, I'm a very passionate person as well, like you. Uh, I don't quite have the courage that you have, uh, but you said something that really resonated to me in my heart, and I went to talk to my wife about it. Um, and I champion for you and for kids like you. Uh, I'm for higher learning, higher education, build a community, all the things that you want to do. And I want you to know, uh, she said something that was very, 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 very dear to my heart. Please come back to Ray Town. We need you. We need people like you. Mm. We need people like-minded like you to come back and serve. Raytown needs more people like you. Raytown High School needs people more like you. So I really want to pay you your flowers. You are tremendous. Thank you. Thank so you. Thank you so much. Are we good for that picture? Yes. <laughs> you want me to do this? Point five. Okay. You want to do it now? Or you want to do it at the end of the meeting? You don't want to stay. You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's what we do. That's what we do. They stand right here. Why don't they stand right here? We'll stand up behind them. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. We'll stand behind you. You want to do a nice one and then a silly one? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I like it. Any more seniors out there? No, I'm I'm fine with them covering me up. Hey, we're not, we're not. Symmetric. Is she standing right yeah, there? Yeah, oh, okay. We want symmetric. Okay. I'm in the middle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> Aiden, Tochi, and Amaya, before you leave. And so let me just add, um, just add a little to what you all have echoed uh, so much here this evening. There's nothing like sitting with our young leaders uh, on a monthly basis just to hear the dialogue and the conversation. And I think Amaya said it best, and they know that that resonates with me. There's nothing more important than serving the customers that we're responsible for. And our children are our customers. And I just want to publicly thank you uh, for always being honest, sometimes yes. brutally honest. Uh, yes. And every time they leave, the work continues. So I just wanted to commend you all. Aiden, I look forward to working with you uh, as they fly off to bigger and better things. It's gonna be you and I, Aiden. And so uh, just thank you. Thank you for being who you are and continue to be the leaders that you are. Just thank you. And while we come to the close of the report of the superintendent, I'd be remiss if I did not today uh, recognize important people throughout our district and throughout our nation who take on the responsibility of empowering those young people who sat in front of us. Last week, we celebrated our superheroes, which are our food service workers. We celebrated assistant principals. We celebrated principals. We've celebrated nurses today. Uh, but this week is Teacher Appreciation Week. And I want you to take a moment to think about that teacher that inspired you the most. And I guarantee you that every thought that you have has nothing to do with the content that they know and the way in which they delivered it, but instead it was about the way in which they made you feel. And so when we sit here and we listen to uh, the voices of our youngsters, I want you to find a teacher, whether in your building, in the community, just to say thank you. The work that they do, uh, you can't even imagine. Uh, but again, as a teacher by heart, always and forever, I just wanted to publicly say thank you to our educators and hashtag thank a teacher. Um, please make sure you take the time to do that because they work so hard uh, to make sure our children are educated. Um, and so that concludes the report of the superintendent. Would you like for me to go ahead and transition to presentations and recognitions? Or would you like to do that, sir chair? I'll do that. Myself. Okay. and recognitions. Good evening, Board of Education, President Burton, Dr. Martin Knox. This evening, we are recognizing two students who are rays of hope in our district. Mariah Turner is a published author and Detravion Wallace placed first in the state speech and debate tournament in informative speaking. And we have a video to learn more about these two amazing students. Tony Davis, the proud principal of Raytown South Middle School, and I would like to let everyone know that our honoree for a ray of hope at Ray South Middle School is Mariah Turner, one of our eighth grade students who is absolutely amazing, involved in and out of school. Uh, things that I very much appreciate about Mariah, she is a ray of hope because she is proud of her school. She takes pride in herself and her work. Um, she's a student who loves English and history. She has a passion for writing. She is our student council president this year. She's also a part of our Scholar Bowl team and our track and field team. So Mariah Turner is definitely someone we'd like to say is a ray of hope. Hi everyone, my name is Mariah Turner. I go to Raytown South Middle School. I'm 13 years old and I'm in the eighth grade. So about a year ago, I had a vision with my mother that I wanted to write a book and I was lucky enough to find someone uh, to illustrate my book who also came from the same background as me, who also had a brother with autism. And so we basically put two and two together and we created the Living in Variety book. It took a lot of hours, a lot of hard work to put my skill of writing and her skill of 
drawing and artwork together because we don't live in the same district so we had to schedule things we have to work stuff with my schedule and work stuff with her schedule so that way we would be able to accomplish things in a more organized way this book living a variety is about the differences that we live around in our community and how it's okay to be different in fact different is actually not good but great and this book means a lot to me because it's about my brother and her brother put together and so it just holds a special place in my heart because it's about someone that I'm especially connected to. I just want everyone to know that it's okay to be different. You shouldn't hide your differences just because of the people around you. This is coming from someone who struggled of being okay with herself because I always felt that because I wasn't like everyone that I thought I was always the single, I was always singled out. And I had to be okay with knowing like, hey, maybe I'm not the average black girl or whatever that means, but at least I am a black girl and I have to embrace who I truly am and know that I'm the way that God made me to be and I have to embrace that. My name is Maureen Thomas, and I'm a speech and debate teacher here at Raytown South. So I have that class, but I am also their sponsor and coach and take them to tournaments. I think that Detroit Beyond Wallace is a ray of hope because they put effort and energy into giving the world a message that the entire community needed and that they see and they are celebrating. This past weekend, our entire state celebrated Trey and their message as they won the state competition for informative speaking. And this is so exciting for a number of reasons. First and foremost in speech and debate, students have the opportunity to really tell the world what they think. And Trey chose to talk about black hair. And there's some ignorance about black hair. There's some history about black hair and our racist past. And Trey handles all of it. Talked about appropriation, talked about how he, they've been treated with their hair and they teach people, but they also get a laugh out of them. They inspire people. And not only other students, but coaches from around the area have been talking about, who is this kid? What is this? This is awesome. And so Trey began to think about this moment last spring. We always, start to at least talk about what's going to happen the year after and as a junior trey came up with the idea to talk about black hair wrote the entire speech beginning middle and end and wowed us in may of 2022 but then they kept tweaking it kept improving it taking our feedback and making some really impressive visual aids to help teach their audience trey has caught the attention of not only our school and our student body and this little speech and debate team, but Trey's caught the attention of local competitors and local coaches, and they have people rooting them on um, across the state now, and we'll get to root them on as we go to nationals in June. I'm Dietrich Neon Wallace, always the Nisha Informed Speaking Champion this year. It feels great. It's not surprising at all. I've been working towards it all year and my hard work has definitely reflected throughout my victories, but even with it, it's still very surprising to see that I made it this far. Um, basically, I started it last year. I was really mad because going into the bait, it's like very, it's a very prestigious activity. And going into it, I had a lot of like people telling me like, oh my God, you're so cute, but your hair would be so much nicer and tidy. And I was like, this is making me mad and I'm gonna make everybody I can. I basically start off talking about how I did magic when I was younger and eventually one of my friends told me that I should be a clown instead of a magician because I had a big nose and an afro. I eventually cut my hair and put magic all together and throughout my speech I talk about how black hair has been mimicked while also demonized throughout all of America and eventually I tie back into it and talk about how over the years I realized that my hair is mine and every part of me is mine and it belongs to me instead of the opinions or the hatred of anybody else. Um, I go to nationals in June and We'll see how it goes. I'm sure I'll do amazing and I can't wait to do amazing, but we just have to see. <laughs> So unfortunately, Detravion cannot be here with us this evening, but Mariah Turner is here and I would ask her to come up, please.
And we have one more recognition. We want to congratulate President Burton for completing his training for Missouri School Boards Association. I'd just like to say that's a, a, a these kids are making me feel very inferior this evening. Very, I I can't believe you're only 13 year, years old. So congratulations and just yeah. just amazing. Next, we have our uh, public comment period. Um, each person will be given five minutes, except, so there's only two tonight, so uh, you can have five minutes to uh, speak. I just want to remind you that uh, the speakers will not be permitted to participate in any gossip, make any defamatory comments, or use abu abusive or vulgar language. Uh, first, I'd like to call Marie Tracy. All right, y'all online missed my intro. <laughs> All right, say if there's only two speakers, that means I get 15 minutes, right? <laughs> All right, um, I'm speaking about item 13.1. Specifically, I wanted to speak about the importance of both giving staff a step and putting money in the base. I'm speaking on behalf of Raytown NEA, a professional organization that represents about 200 district employees. We always look forward to the Ray team presentation and the hard work that committee does to represent all staff. And we know the board does all you can to make Raytown a great place to work. I'll never forget the time the board even argued that Ray team needed to ask for more than to let staff know that they were valued. The way our salary charts work, I know a few of you are newer, is that educators move to the right on the salary chart when they gain more education and they move upward when the board provides a step. While the district states that steps do not equal years of experience, we find that when a step is not provided, that leads to pay inequities among staff. The reason for this is that when teachers are hired into the district, they are given steps equal to their years of experience. So if a teacher is hired with five years of experience, they're started on step six for their sixth year. However, if a teacher has been loyal to Raytown those same five years, they may be on step two or three if the board has not provided a step each year. We have teachers who are already five years behind on steps due to past salary freezes. And as those individuals get closer to retirement, which in the Missouri educator system is based on your income, many find it difficult to stay in a district that does not monetarily value their experience and loyalty to our students who need them our students hugely benefit from staff experience and consistency. However, raises to the base are also extremely important. That helps us attract new teachers, that helps us try to address inflation. And yes, people understand that adding money to the base increases the dollar amounts throughout the whole entire chart. Page turn. However, when teachers do not receive a step, Raytown NEA has observed that the resulting pay inequities can lead to resentment and burnout among the loyal Raytown teachers who are paid less than people who transfer in, and this does not help our students. I would encourage the board to keep retention in mind and show loyal staff that they are valued by the district as you make tough decisions tonight. Retaining quality teachers is one of the best things we can do for our students. Raytown NEA strongly recommends providing both a step 
and a raise to the base whenever it is financially feasible, as well as addressing the existing staff pay inequities caused by past step freezes. Minimizing existing and preventing future pay inequities encourages staff retention, which benefits our students. Thank you for all you do. Next five minutes, we'll have Carrie Flacher. <laughs> Hi, I said, oh, great. This Hold it the whole time. No, there we go. Okay. Good evening. My name is Carrie Plater, and I'm speaking on agenda item 13.1, the rating recommendations for the 2023-2024 school year. Tonight, I'm speaking on behalf of the Raytown NEA about the importance of supporting step restoration for long-term Raytown teachers. I will be using my story as an example, but my story is the same for many of our long-term Raytown teachers. I've been working as a fax teacher at Raytown South High School for 17 years. In fact, I've had several board members' kids. <laughs> um, however, I'm paid at step 12 due to salary freezes early on in my career. A lack of step restoration has created large pay inequities in our district. These inequities re have resulted in tension and resentment amongst staff. Long-term Raytown employees are paid less than new hire teachers to the district. New hires that the long-term staff are asked to help acclimate to the district. New hires we are asked to train. The practice of giving new hires all their steps and treating steps as years experience when hiring into the district, but telling long-term employees that steps do not equal years experience has made long-term Raytown teachers believe that years experience outside the district are more valuable than years in Raytown. I know this is not the case. My longevity in Raytown is an immense benefit to this district. I know families. I know school history. I know students. These are things that cannot be replicated by a person who is new to the district. I love working at Raytown South High School. It has been my home, a place I spend countless hours, made countless connections, and hopefully made a long lasting impression and impact. I want my last day teaching to be in room 114 at South High. However, at some point, I must look at the fact that I would only make more money in surrounding districts because they would give me all my steps. Every year, I have watched the number of long-term teachers to the district diminish. We can't deny that teacher steps are a factor when long-term Raytown teachers leave, especially since our retirement is directly based on the income in Missouri and on our income in Missouri. We're facing a major teacher shortage and it will get worse. At this point, we are all hiring from the same pool because there are not new teachers joining the field. I was called by a neighboring district about an opening, even though I applied for no jobs this year. I know that I am not the only person who had that happen. We must do all we can to keep good teachers in Raytown. And one of the most important things we can do is restore steps to our long-term teachers. It will show the district's commitment to them and their work in Raytown. If all the long-term Raytown teachers leave, who will be left to show the new hires the ropes? I beg the board to support Ray Team's recommendation to give back a long overdue step to long-term employees. Additionally, I hope the board will direct Ray team to create a plan to finish restoring steps and create plans to create a climate of longevity in our district so people want to stay here. Raytown NEA supports Ray team's three recommendations for the 2023-2024 school year, and we ask the board to also support those recommendations. Thank you very much. Thank you both for your comments. Next, we'll have uh, board committee reports. And um, I will be uh, taking uh, time to uh, assign the uh, new, new committee for our new uh, board members and present all our board members. Um, probably. We'll uh, solidify that before the next board meeting. Um, also, we plan to have board retreat 
on uh, June 10th. Um, and more emails and information be coming out for that. That will be uh, a uh, Friday uh, dinner and then uh, sessions uh, on Saturday. Any uh, committee reports? Moving forward, moving May 31st, October 13.13 million units. Is there a second? Okay. Any other committee? Yes. Uh, the Curriculum and Professional Development Committee convened today, um, and we dis uh, discussed four different areas. Uh, we talked about uh, an equity council, which is a committee comprised of district staff at all levels, uh, about 100. And um, that committee is forming so that they can implement a three-year plan that utilizes tiers one to three to provide a structure to meet the needs of all learners so they can meet proficiency. And so the initial focus is going to be on uh, numeracy and literacy. And so one of the goals is to establish a culture of collective responsibility. Uh, with the tier one structures, uh, that ensures that every student receives the essential, it's essential excuse me, on learning to have their needs met, and then each tier becomes more progressive with, um, with the interventions that are needed. Uh, they met in April, and uh, some of the discussion in the April meeting was to have book studies. Uh, they created uh, an essential goals document, which they'll be mapping their plan from, and then there were also conversations around how to deliver effective tier two instruction. Uh, tier three will be uh, more of the targeted focus in 2024, 2025, and that will address the needs of students that are well below the grade level, again, ensuring that they also have high quality instruction uh, so that their needs are met. Uh, point two that we discussed was the district leadership retreat. Uh, this would be something new where those building leadership teams will all meet to create uh, the school improvement plan with the focus on four different areas academic achievement, attendance, uh, looking at our trauma smart uh, model and training and interventions and then improving behaviors. And so every school will be committed to this plan, uh, which is also uh, at this leadership retreat, uh, the, they're gonna have discussion of that strategic plan work. Um, the leadership teams will begin sharing out at board meetings each month about the growth in all of those four areas that I just named. And this ensures intentionality and accountability. Um, and let's see, we will also have teacher teams that will be sharing out best practices around those four areas to show growth. Uh, uh, there is a discussion on um, different types of goals, wildly important goals. And so these are really targeted focused goals where teachers and principals can uh, have discussions uh, looking at unit by unit, skill by skill, student by student. And then uh, we discuss um, point three, professional learning opportunities this summer uh, using solution tree for that professional development where leaders, teachers, and people can convene over multiple days uh, to help support the implementation of our tiered systems of support. And these individuals will have an opportunity to share their learning when they convene to the building in August uh, and throughout the year. And then the last item was uh, looking at new teacher support um, in August, 2023. And so feedback was taken from staff to have uh, some changes that are made to allow for more flexibility uh, for teachers, for instance, to acclimate more with the technology, providing a longer time built in to be able to do those things, uh, shifting the diversity and cultural competency training and making that earlier um, during day one of that week that they come back, uh, providing mentors who help support new teachers with really focused uh, intentional training to support those needs of the new teachers. And then there were some other changes that were made to allow for 
uh, grade levels to convene in smaller groupings uh, for that intentional support. And I think, did I miss something? Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, since we hasn't haven't had a report in a while, I thought just to give you more detail than less. Texas urban students have a uh, policy adopted as a board policy. This is President of the Policies, AC, Honesty, Equity, and Inclusion, CDDD, Agendas, the CDDH, Public Participation of Board Meetings, IPCB Virtual Courses, IPCBA Full Time MOCAP Virtual Time Public Participation of Board Meetings. Virtual courses and JECA eligibility to enroll and KC community involvement in decision making. Motion made and seconded. Next in new business, we have the great team 23, 24 recommendations. Uh, that was obviously some NEA and representatives from MSTA as well. So that's that's who I'm kind of representing tonight. So good evening, uh, Dr. Martin Knox, uh, President Burton, members of the board. I believe I heard uh, we have the vice president and just Mr. Watson, right? Okay, excellent. Okay, very good. Um, yeah, it's definitely my pleasure to represent NEA as a member of Ray team. Um, I believe there's a presentation that we can kind of see. I'm breaking down. Oh, can you guys see the, the presentation? Okay, excellent. So um, breaking down the membership, um, I am an NEA representative on Ray team, and then I have two other representatives that serve with me, Mary and Megan. So NEA has three reps, and then MST has three reps as well, Amy, Susie, and Brian. Um, we all represent um, various buildings throughout the district, elementary, art, library, um, early childhood, high school, Herndon Career Center. So we all come from a wide, varied backgrounds representing all of our you know, members. Um, then there's classified members. We have uh, Matt, Karen, Regina, Jamison, and Melissa. They all re represent like areas of technology, cafeteria, admin exec, building and ground nurses. And then administrative members are uh, Carl, uh, who's our HR representative, former principal, Tony Davis, uh, South Middle principal, Terry Gibson Finance, and Julie Schmidley is a uh, little blue. So um, all of these members have a deep personal investment, not just as employees, but many people have 
graduated from Raytown. Um, they have kids that have went to Raytown. That's, that's me included. My daughter attends the building I'm at. So it's not just about um, representing you know, our employment, it's representing our investment in the district. Um, the mission of Ray Team is definitely a collaborative uh, team working together for consensus to improve the quality of the workplace, recommend an affordable and competitive compensation package for all employees of, of Raytown. Um, I've been on the team for uh, about four years now, I believe. Um, I came in as, as a member was leaving the district, and then I, I, I came into the group and learned the ropes a little bit. And over the years, it's gotten better and better. I feel like the way that we collaborate, the way that we problem solve is probably at the top of the, the level. It's just a really, um, you hear a lot of perspectives, and that's where this process comes in, into play. So um, Ray Team's schedule and method of gathering information, we meet monthly beginning in September. Uh, we develop a survey each year that's sent out to district employees. This year's survey, we gathered 833 responses. Uh, the results guide our work for that year. Um, we're anticipating as we get into buildings in the upcoming year, we're going to ramp up the number of people that respond to those surveys. Over time, when we weren't able to, to get into buildings, we feel the engagement kind of went down. And then when COVID was going on, there was a lot of survey um, fatigue. People, So we're, we're looking at getting a lot more responses in the future. Um, we receive monthly updates from finance and HR. Uh, Ray team members share feedback and concerns from buildings and departments they represent. That's kind of a new feature to the team this year was um, Carl came in as the HR representative and basically he's been on, on Ray team for many years and he wanted to hear back from people and we do a kind of around the horn and we get a lot of feedback and all of our members, you know, kind of get a little bit of the pulse of what's going on. So that's been really helpful. Um, we regularly invite district leaders and department heads to meetings and discuss concerns and suggestions. Um, I actually just had something hatch in my head about like hearing hearing those student council reps tonight. I'm like, Ray team would probably in the future, we might talk about getting getting those reps in there and talking about how we could maybe present a proposal. Um, that is just me flying off the cuff with that. But we have had Dr. Martin Knox in here and and. I'm actually dressed up as a result of hearing something that she said in the meeting about her speaking so passionately about, about teachers in, in, in dress and looking sharp. And it was in regard to jeans. And she, she, she basically um, compromised on that matter. I like people looking sharp and being dressed up, but I also respect the idea that um, teachers, you know, feel morale is good to have jeans. So lots of constructive talk comes out of having people in. Dr. Griner's come in, talked about curriculum instruction, partnerships that we can have to get things uh, that we need to implement, feeling better for everyone involved. Um, a lot of partnership. Um, we've had CBiz came in and talked about the health insurance process, about how, how the district seeks to, to get all of that. Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to the resident um, doctor oh, of <laughs> historian of Ray Team, and he's going to kind of lay it out for us. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, all. I'm Brian Wise. I've been teaching over at Herner Career Center for 29 years. This is my 29th year. I've been on Ray Team for 14 years. Um, a lot of new faces, a lot of familiar faces. Um, some of you don't know me, but a lot of you do. Uh, when we get our survey information, we, we take the data from that and we rank it by what's most important and what we get as far as feedback. We do look at qualitative and, and quantitative data uh, when we do the surveys. Um, this year, the top things were salary increase, step restoration, affordable benefits, jeans days, uh, revised the PBD policy, and protected uh, plan time. So from that, we came to our recommendations. And we, uh, uh, our recommendations are to increase the personal business days from four days per school year to five days. Um, we also would like to recommend that we update staff conduct dress code uh, GBCB. AP1 um, number eight to allow for facial piercings. We also have some salary recommendations, um, a step to every salary schedule, a 3% increase to the base, which is 1200 on the teacher salary schedule, and a one-step restoration for the school year 2011-2012 employees uh, with continuous employment Raytown School District who have not moved salary schedules since then. Part of the reason we came, this is a big proposal, um, a lot bigger than what we've become with the past. We have some, <clears throat> excuse me, some supporting rationale. There's historical narrative projections um, of reserve balances running less than 15%. Mr. Moore, I think you can attest to that. You've talked about that before on open board. Um, these projections are what we have used, always used in making salary recommendations. These, rec these recommendations are the, the, the projections we're not realized. In other words, when we, if you look at 19, 
uh, our projected fund balance is going to be 7%, and the actual fund balance was 18%. So that's kind of why we went a little harder than what we normally do. The, the current landscape of four-day work weeks and high salary increases in the surrounding districts, um, we need to be as competitive as possible as we can be and still be fiscally responsible. Um, we are concerned uh, with, the, with teachers leaving. In conclusion, Ray Team is committed to advocating for competitive salaries and benefits for all employees. Ray Team acknowledges and appreciates the efforts the board has taken to renew staff morale and community pride in our school district. Ray Team acknowledges and appreciates the difficult decisions the board has called upon to make, as well as the time it takes to deliberate for those decisions. Y'all give up a lot of personal time. We understand that. Ray Team shares the same goal with the Board of Education to attract and retain a quality staff for Raytown, Raytown Quality Schools. Anybody got any questions? Pardon me? I'm yes, all, all of those. Huh? All of them. Yes. Yep. And where are they? You do have here, so. Right. This would be facial. This would be eyebrow, nose. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Oh, sorry. You can come forward right. to speak. Oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> the Salisbury, the facial piercing. Oh, I'm sorry. Let us know who you are. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Amy Lowe Smith, a member of Ray Team. The facial piercing would be including nose ring, eyebrow, and lip. So we already had earrings. We're already um, board approved. It would be other facial piercings other than your ear. Well, do we not want, does it affect your teaching? I mean, so do we want to not have a candidate be a teacher because of something like that when we don't want to miss out on a great teacher? I just don't understand. I really don't. I mean, why do you, why do you need it as far as, I mean, it's beyond me. I don't understand why we would even bring something like that to the board for approval. I, I got it. The, the way the, the policy is written, Ms. Salisbury, is that right now, if, if a person has a, a nose piercing, very small one, they can be written up by admin. And so that's what we're trying to eliminate is allowing the piercings. If we don't put a, a change to language where it allows piercings, then people that have a lip ring or a nose ring or some type of piercing like that, that's still considered what we consider appropriate, they can be written up. In other words, yes, sorry. I'm not used to the microphone. I thought I had a good voice, but anyway. Um, so to me, that lowers your standard. It's just like you telling me, why can't I have changed the policy to come in my pajamas some days? I mean, you, when you think about it, true. where is the boundary? Where do you draw the line at? Well, I know that our superintendent would allow that for sure. No, it's not about her. No, it's I know. About, where do you draw the line at to say what can and cannot be worn to school? You are a professional. I understand that. And we're, in a, we're at a point now where we have a lot of younger people that I'm not even going to. I mean, to train even, the young people. Pardon? You need to train them. And, and that's part of it as well. Standard, and they follow that standard. Right. If we let everything, this is what's going on in our world today. Everything is is good for anything and everything and everybody. <laughs> There's something else I'd like to add to that. So we're talking about culturally accepting other people. In other cultures, face piercing is definitely part of their culture. So I've grown up with a lot of friends who are um, from cultures that nose piercing is very common. Every member of their family would have it. So I don't feel like we're lowering our standards when we're also accepting other people's cultures. And that's something that we've sworn that we're going to do here in this district is be accepting to other cultures. So maybe that's part of their culture or, or or something like that that we don't want to discount. Well, I'm totally uh, at loss for that one. I really am. All right, Mr. President. Can I ask if, if that's, uh, this, are the students allowed to do that? Yes. Have piercings all over like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but long, I have a young lady that currently has three nose piercings and a lip piercing. And she's still well. They're not, they're not sitting <laughs> I would, I would be interested in seeing, uh, I mean, you stating that there's, is, is, I would be interested in seeing the data behind 
uh, are we losing teachers because of facial piercings or not having or not having the opportunity to hire a person? Uh, that would be I'd be I'm not saying it's not true. Right. I'm just saying I'd be interested in seeing something along those lines that that is something that I mean, when we're talking about um, recommendation, uh, I just think there's there's a lot more things that's weighing in importance. But I do understand what you're saying. I mean, I, it's kind of like the same thing as uh, when Amaya came up and talked about uh, what's going on as far as ISS. It's the same, and a teacher getting written up, and, this, and then the inequities of students having piercings and teachers not. Having. But at the same time, students are being taught, students are being being trained about being professional what and what we're defining as professional. Correct, and that's I'm why not, we have I'm a dress code. I'm not as adamant about it, but I, I would like to see the evidence of what you're saying. We're just trying to prevent people being written up that are already currently employed. And so that, that's, 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 a, that's the bottom line. That's a that's something that's increasing and that's a problem. Right. Okay. That's, it it saying, could be. Like yeah, it could that. be a problem. That's 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 part of what we do is look at things that can be a potential problem. So we want to eliminate that problem before it becomes a problem. I understand that I'm not I'm not saying that it's not. I'm just saying I would be interested in seeing how big of a problem that is. Correct. Right. Just like I am going to see how how big of a problem it is for ISS for his being late. Like, sure. That's something I would. Sure. Anyway, I did have a question though. Sure. You put up uh, the projections for uh, past years. Yes. Of our uh, reserve balance. I would like to ask you what was the raise in 19, 20, and 21 in regards to the what was projected? Because I don't believe that whatever was projected. Um, I don't believe it affected what we did as a board. Right. And so that means that's a mute point in, in what you're saying, because the projections were never what we use to decide uh, teachers getting raises or not. Mm, I think that part of it has been based on that in the past. That's why I want to know, because what the way I remember it um, is that, the board approved something more than what um, Ray team. You're absolutely right. Before. Yep. Yep. And so even despite the projections, right. So what I'm saying is the projections were such, but it was not, a, the decision didn't, those projections didn't affect the decisions. Right. And and by the time we came to that meeting, we already knew that those projections were incorrect. And that's why you guys, that's why y'all went and did the extra. I remember that. But we always, well, we always, I personally don't remember projections below 20% because I've always tried to hold the standard. But I'm I'm asking, I'm not asking what the projections were because those projections never matter. Right. Because we gave the raises. But that's but that's part of what we based our recommendations to the board on. Okay. Is based on those projections. Oh, and so, so instead of asking for more, you didn't ask as much right, because right. of the projections. Right. Because the projections we didn't we didn't push for more. And that's what so that's what you're not doing now. Um, <laughs> no, that's the not good thing. Can I, so can I say I, not yet. So you're saying that <laughs> I'm at so right now the recommendation that you guys are making is not based on the projections being made. It's pushing, it would push the projections. In other words, if if we were if we were to look at five years down the road. And everything's flatlined, then it would look bad. But that's what they've always done. But we're asking for more than we no we're normally would, based on the projections that we've seen. And and we believe uh, in our financial. Uh, you do know professional. I mean, I know you realize that we also have someone different making projections. Correct. Correct. And that does make a difference. And I agree with that one hundred percent. Okay. Yep. Because we all got a bomb laid in our lap last year, and the. <laughs> and the and the and we, we yeah we really we did with the impression that uh, this this the next three years we might be facing freezes again, which I would say uh, one thing I've said in my heart that we would never do that. Right, right. I mean, I'm just one board member, but 
I will fight for never to do that again. Right. And so, <laughs> uh, what I'm saying is, is that if you say the projections, oh, it affected you. I, I get that. Right. Okay. But at the same time, the board, it affected you, but the board also gave more than what you asked for. But we've also walked out of this meeting and had board members ask us why we didn't ask for more. Correct. Multiple times. That's, that's, that was one of them. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but I'm saying is, is that when you, when you, the projections was never affected the decision that was being made. Because we gave more than what you asked for. One, yeah, one time. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. Yeah. That's Rick. Mr. Moore. I would well, first of all, I want to back up a little bit. Does Ray Team still use a consensus model to, to reach your your conclusions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. That's good to know. I just wasn't sure if you still use a consensus model. So your guys are pretty much in consensus for all five of these recommendations. Absolutely we are. I'm still guessing though that that your last three are more more important to you than the first two. And especially the ones re regarding the, the piercings. Sure. Am I correct in saying that? Oh yeah. All right. So um we'll have more discussion about this, but I would say just on the projections, the projections did affect what we did and, and they did affect what they requested. Maybe not the year where we gave more, but every year Ray team is given what the projected balances are, just like the board is, and they're and then they have a discussion, come to a consensus, okay, based on the projection of the fund balance going to end up being this, this is what we think is reasonable to ask from the board. Right. And we've done and, that since and, 2009. And this is the first time you've thrown this back in our face, which I don't blame you because it's valid. You're saying that the projections have always varied widely. So you're comfortable in asking for a 3% to the base in one step. And we feel like we have to, to re retain the people we've got. Well, I'll just speak to, speak to myself and, and, you know, I got, I've always been honest with you guys. Uh, I'm going to support the three percent to the base and the step, but I'm not going to support the the respiration step right now. I think it your Terry, your speech made me think about some things that we could look at and made me be more open to it. But the, we froze those way back twelve years ago because we were we had a problem. We needed to freeze it. There was never any promise that those steps were going to be restored. So I think that's why I'm not going to support that part of the recommendation at this time but i'm more willing to look at it now than, than i was before so. so um if we look at if we don't go by projections and we look at the revenue the revenue in the freeze years matches the revenue we currently have and so um given that <laughs> I don't think one thing I I, I really uh, forget which one said it, it might have <laughs> been Miss Tracy or Miss Player. She gave all the reasons, but at the end she said when financially responsible. And so, not based on projections, not based on projections, based on what we know, the status, the state of our district and the decline in several areas of our of what we've been dealing with i i'd have a hard time supporting the recommendation this year i'm sorry to hear that but, but i saying, but i'm like I'm, you I'm, I'm, I'm just yep and i've never not done that right. but i'm saying given where the what's been revealed i do believe those rejections are wrong but I, that person is no longer here. Right. And I do, and I think that's probably something we should have looked at because those projections were long, wrong for so long. But historically, we but, know that in bad times, economic times, that that's when our enrollment grows. And I'm betting on that. Okay. In 2008, 2009, so that's when, when we our had- our enrollment has grown. Yep. I think we can revisit that. Yep. But we haven't- I live here still. 
And I, I there in my neighborhood, I've seen there's four new houses getting ready to be put back on the market. So I'm hopeful. <laughs> as, as am I. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that this this is the first year of six that we've experienced any sort of growth in any area. Mm -hmm. And as long as the economy the stays bad, we'll keep growing. <laughs> Okay. I know that's a horrible thing to say, but that's the way this district okay. is. Well, that's I just that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have anything? I mean, I can't. Uh, oh, I I would like to have more understanding on the facial piercing punitive yeah. punitiveness that people experience because their face they have an earring in their eyebrow or an earring in their nose. I'd like to understand how many people. Are affected by that policy. Do you know, Brian? I, I don't have any idea. Is it more of a, and I don't envy either our side, I don't envy either one of the decision makers. We have to make the decisions because this is a difficult thing to discuss. Um, in regards to the facial piercings and the ability to be, I mean, the, to be allowed to have those things, I personally don't see anything wrong with it. I mean, it's just, it's who we are, it's how we express ourselves. But there's nothing wrong with that. I would like to see what are the punitive things, not that it dictates what I think, but it's just like, are people being written up for something like that when the times and the climate have changed? Um, I know we influence our younger people, but our younger people also influence us and, and style and dress and cultural competency and culture you know, appropriation and how those things are looked at have changed. And so I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, and I'm learning a lot and I appreciate the members who have reached out to me via email to kind of get me up to speed when it comes to the steps and the percentages um, and how it how it has run uh, in our district historically when it was freezes um, and what happened in those in those times, you know, and, and having to make up for it. On the other hand, having to look at where we are as a district financially and our responsibilities to be good stewards with where we are and to fully understand um, the state of our district financially and compared to, you know, when the, when the economy is bad and enrollment do, does go up, well, in six years, we've had one year of, of enrollment go up. As director of REAP, I know that very well. I know that very well because it, it, it affects and impacts the people we, we serve. Um, and so when you're looking at it from the standpoint of really comes down to what we can afford, what we can really afford to do as a district um, with with staying financially responsible to you know our 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 our, our stakeholders and our children to make sure that other things don't impact um, their ability to to get the resources and things on top of wanting to retain our quality teachers who are dedicated to the district uh, who have put in time who have who have sacrificed to uh, make sure that they have a a salary and they know that they are appreciated. So that's personal for me. That's that's something that, um, again, I'm learning and I want to continue to stay on that path of learning. So that way we can create a plan. And, and I'm big on the fact that we have a new regime, we have new leadership, we have new administrators and who I know for a fact know what they're talking about. We just want to be transparent. They know what they're talking about. Because when you see things in the past, you've seen things that should have been done and weren't done, you can't go back and necessarily fix them all. But you can start from now and you can make that plan together as I, I didn't know about the, the, the meetings per se, I probably would have uh, showed up, but we could create that plan collectively because I, I don't want it to be us and y'all. I, I don't want it to be personal. I want it to be, how can we create the plan that best works for everybody, most importantly, our students. And, and most importantly, secondly to that, as, as our, our teachers and, and uh, how they feel and being able to retain quality teachers. I'm sorry, I'm done. No, that's great, I agree with you so much. So one of the things I think that we, we didn't exactly cover earlier was that Ray team asks two questions. What are the things we can do for you um, as a district, teachers, staff, um, you know, all staff? What are the things we can do for you to make your quality of work like better? We have one whole group that is non-monetary. What are things we can do for you that don't cost the district any money? Because as we see, the, the money issue is, you know, is an issue. And then we also ask the questions, what do you want that costs money? So we have these two 
entities, right? So some of the things that we're asking for that don't cost the district any money that could possibly make someone's quality of work life better is the facial piercing and the PBD days. So that means that instead of it's a sick day, it's, an, it's a personal business day. So those are two things that cost nothing. The other thing we did was also add a jeans day. Thank you. Or dungarees or however you want to address that one. So that's why we have these two things here and then the money issue because Ray team asks for those things very specifically. What can we do that doesn't cost the district money? And then what is monetary? Can okay. I ask you a question? Yes. I'm sorry. What's your name again? Amy Lowe Smith. And how long have you been with us? Um, I've been in the position I'm at 14 years. Before that, I was a long-term sub in the district for five. Both of my parents are alumni hall of fame and my husband's family is one of the founding families of Raytown. I've been here forever. That's awesome. Thank you, too. My next question is, as a, since you've been here, you have that the long history. How are some of the things that we're, that, that we're discussing that have like personally impacted you? Because we hear it as a collective. But I want to know how, it, how it's impacted you. Has it impacted your decision to stay in the district as long as you have, to consider other options? Or how has it, it worked for you personally? This is my last year. I've already put in my resignation, and the board has accepted it. Um, the monetary issue is not for me personally. I have a different financial situation than other people. It was not the issue for me. I left for other reasons. Um, I do not have facial piercing. So that's, you know, not for me. However, I do have a daughter in medical school who did attend Raytown schools and is now at Johns Hopkins University and has her nose pierced. She's a specialist in neurological implants to move your prosthetics. And because she has a nose ring, doesn't make her any less capable than anyone else to um, do your implant or help create an implant for you. So that's me personally, because that's my child. Um, you know, yes, I know older people may look at her a little different, but I tell you what, you want a bright kid who's doing something, nose ring or not, that's going to be a kid who's going to do it. So we need to look past those things um, because people have talents that a nose ring or an eyebrow piercing has nothing to do with their ability. Let me make myself clear. What I was saying was why were we bringing this before the board for, and I did not have the understanding that you had people that were being penalized for wearing your rings or whatever. So we I, had we had to bring it before the board because it's a board policy. So in order to change it. That, oh. I understood that it was a policy, but what I was concerned about, I, we say yes, do not uh, penalize a person because they wear a nose ring or what have you. I just think that it's a standard. It has nothing to do with the character of the person. I'm not speaking about no one's character. I'm just speaking about the standard. When we uh, lower our standards, that increases more and more before, before you know it. I mean, I'm just using it as a wild example. I mean, you say a nose piercing, first you have a little small earring, then next thing you have a big earring, maybe. I don't know, but I just was curious how that was an issue. I didn't realize you were having people being penalized. So I am curious as to how many people are affected by such a policy as this. I don't really have the number from the Ray team survey. Like I said, it was just something that Ray team brought to your attention because it is a board policy and it was a non-monetary item that we thought could maybe um, help somebody's quality of work life. Thank you, thank you. Um, I would like the, the board to hear, um, you know, the board uh, hires and employs one person. So we should probably hear from our superintendent on what she thinks of the recommendations and what the, what she recommends or the administration. I'm just taking it all in now. Um, <laughs> so let me just say the, the conversations we've engaged in are, are very sensitive and they're emotional. And I just need to reiterate uh, what Ms. Tracy has said and what the team has said. We work every day for our children, but more importantly, I work for you, right? I work to make sure that our children have the best educators and the best support staff possible. While we have several recommendations that are on the table, um, one, I'm going to ask that we go back and revisit it because I'm not sure if it's a policy problem or if it's an issue that we need to address with leadership, and that would be the piercings. 
And I hope it doesn't get me in trouble because my grandmother was very angry with me, but we will talk about piercings and I don't have facial piercings, piercings, but I have five earrings up both ears. And I started one day, she left me home from church. I should have gone to church. And she didn't realize until I was a senior in high school that I was trying to put my name in my ear. Well, my name is Penelope. So I got to five and I thought the other ones were going to hurt. So I stopped. So that did not become a reality. But I will say to you, because of professional appearance, I don't wear all of my earrings. But let's have a conversation about the expectations in the appearance. And I'm not sure if that's a conversation with and for the board, but it is something that the team and I can go back and look at and evaluate. Because I do believe regardless as to whether it's a small stud or whether it's a big hoop or whether it's an earlobe, tire, whatever they're called, hanging from the ear, there has to be an, a professional appearance for it all. And I said that with a smile, but it's all in seriousness, because as we stand in front of children to continue to model, sometimes we have to inspect what we expect. And so I think that that is a deeper conversation. And while we come together all the time to meet, to discuss and resolve matters, I think this is one that we can sit down and have a conversation with. So I, I'm not looking for a recommendation for that right now. I think this is a leadership matter and an expectations matter. So I would like to have a deeper conversation regarding that. I do believe people need to be their individual self, uh, but I also think that there is uh, some parameters that need to be put in place with that. The next piece um, that I would bring forward is the personal business days. We've had this conversation and while I meet with uh, the teachers group, it has come up to me as well. Um, the personal business days right now, there are 10 allocated days, six for six, six for sick, four for personal business. And they were very upfront and, you know, honest with me to say, you know, I don't want to be untrustworthy uh, or to put on a facade to say that I'm sick when I'm not just so I can use my days. I support the five in five, five personal business, five sick. But again, that's just my recommendation moving forward. Um, I do support that, that ability to have our professionals have those five personal business days and those five sick days uh, to be able to utilize when it's needed. But I also need to put on the table and to thank the board because whenever I come to the board to say, can we support our staff in certain ways? You have always been amenable to that. And I will just say, because we continue to face the financial challenges, for example, with the snow days, you didn't blink twice when I asked, could we allow them to not have to make up those three snow days? And so when we look at those factors, I'm not talking about neighboring districts. I can only focus on Raytown. Those are the small things that oftentimes we forget when we talk about what we do for our staff. And I do do for our staff, just to make sure you know we appreciate you. Those two snow, snow days that were called, you had no control over that. But I had the, the authority to make the decision to close schools. For the safety of our students and our staff, we close schools. But I came to the board and I asked, would you forgive those two days of inclement weather and the one red snow day uh, to celebrate our football team? So we don't have to make those three days up. So when we talk about compensation, those are things that I believe we need to take into consideration as well. When we move forward, and I'll just go back and play in my mind. I had officially said yes. I believe I had already signed my contract. Maybe I had it, but I had attended a board meeting. And the bomb that was dropped that day was, we're going to freeze salaries for the next three years, and we're going to start closing schools. I could have done one or two things. Sit there and put my seatbelt on and begin to enjoy the ride or run out the door. I chose to be here to make sure we do what's best for our community and to do what's best for our children. And so it, with intentionality, one of my goals is fiscal responsibility. And what I've said is we have to check adult behavior to make sure we balance it with our finances, but with intentionality, with finding someone who had that background to do the numeracy aspect of balancing our budget. We talk, I know Mr. Gibson gets tired of seeing my number show up on his phone. I'm not going to look at him because he's probably nodding, but I know he gets tired of me calling him to say, bring me back this set of numbers, bring this set of numbers, look at these sets of numbers. Let's talk about this. Where can we cut? 
bring the, we did something a little different this year as well. Mr. Gibson met with everyone in the district who's responsible for a budget and had a conversation with how we're spending those monies. Because I do believe in investing in our people. I do believe in making sure compensation is what we can do in a level that does not send our district backwards. And so when I said to him, he said, meet with everybody, everybody. And so he sat at the table with everyone bringing their budget and we allowed staff to bring forward recommendations and identify places where they could reduce their spending without having a major impact on our schools. So let me just say this again, closing schools, the other piece that hasn't happened is while our student enrollment has declined with about 800 students, that should have required major staffing cuts. We've not had a conversation about cutting staff. Right. We have not had a conversation about cutting staff. So while it may not benefit some people in the pockets to keep them here, understand that when we make decisions, they're about people. They're about investing in people. And so I'm only giving you this background information because the only thing that things that keep me up at night is the safety of staff and students and money. And when I used to teach grad classes and doctoral classes, I used to tell people the fastest way to get fired from any job is to do what? You mess up the money. And so we have to make sure that while we don't have a crystal ball moving forward with the financial piece of our district, we have to make these predictions about where we're going to go, where the revenue is going to come from. With the reduction in student enrollment, right now, DESE has been funding us based on our enrollment from 2020. Prior to the pandemic, we've lost a lot of students and this is not a Raytown issue. This is a national issue. This is a phenomena no one even predicted. We lost students, but DESE, as well as many other state agencies, have decided to continue to fund us based on our enrollment from 2020. They're not doing it anymore. So now we have to balance out and figure out a way to make ends meet. We have to make sure that while we should not have to make decisions about the finances, Sometimes we have to make decisions with finances first. So with that moving forward, we've not talked about cutting positions. We've not talked about closing schools. But if we make one mistake, that's going to have to be the next conversation because we're at bare bones. And again, let me replay that conversation. You're going to have to close schools and freeze salaries for three years. So at this point, with the work of Mr. Gibson, with the work of everybody coming together to make those hard decisions, I would propose to the board that we give our staff 2% to the base as an increase and one step. That would be my proposal. The other component with the restoration, we are, when I look at the budgetary lines, we are in a place financially where we were when that original budget cut or freeze took place. Again, we're forecasting where we could be next year. We're forecasting where we could be at the end of the year. 2% keeps us okay, but one sneeze and we could be in a place where I'm again, let me remind you, closing schools and cutting staff. And again, we've not reduced staff and then the other factor that we need to take into consideration, the ESSER funds have already been allocated. They'll be exhausted. There are no more ESSER funds. And there were 67, Dr. Calcara, help me out. So I don't want to publicly give the wrong number. How many positions did we purchase with ESSER funds? Up to 67. So 69. So you're testing my math. <laughs> so we purchased as a district 69 positions. And I said to staff, I believe in our people. We hired people. I should not now turn around two years later, three years later and say, you're done. Have a good day. Because I do believe the people that were hired are what's best for our children. So we're trying to maintain staffing, maintain building openings, while also compensating our staff where I believe you should be and then some. So that's my proposal would be 2% to the base and one step. 
The restoration component, unless someone miraculously comes and gives us less than a million dollars, almost $800,000, I don't see us, and I'm just going to be completely transparent, I don't see us being able to do that. I could do one or the other. I could give the 2% to base and a step, or I can do the $800,000 for the restoration. We can't do all three. But what I can promise you is the same phone calls I give Mr. Gibson, the same conversations we have about our revenue, they will be continuous. And who's to say that next year at this time, we're not having a conversation where we can say, and this is just hyperbolic, right? Let's go ahead and do, no, I'm not going to say that because somebody will come back and play and say she said we were. <laughs> we can move forward in a different place. But right now, we need to make sure that the forecast that we have, we're in a good place. And I think we're in a good place because like I said, where we were last year, three years of frozen steps and closing buildings. And we're not there. Hopefully we will never be there. So again, making those adjustments and moving forward. So again, I would recommend to propose that the piercings conversation allow me with staff to have that dialogue with Ray team and to continue to have that conversation. The restoration, we can't afford that right now. It's a one or the other. The other proposal is 2% to the base one step and to continue to revisit our salaries and our staff and where we are. Um, and uh, I think I got them all because I have your notes everywhere, my notes everywhere. So the personal business days is the other one. And I'm in agreement with giving the five personal and the five sick days. Those are the proposals or the thinking where I am at this particular point in time. Would be permitted to make a follow-up? No, not after I speak. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I just heard several things from a lot of board members and, and from you talking just now. Um, and, and I appreciate this is very actually very reflective of what occurs in a Ray team meeting where we have people um, talking from a lot of perspectives. They're, they're hard conversations to have. And I feel like whenever we have an alternating point, points of view going around and we try to weigh them and, and see where people stand and where people feel, um, we, we always value that honesty and that passion. And um, we know, like um, I heard uh, Rick, basically his, his opinion on, on the idea of step restoration changed a lot tonight based on the comments. Um, knowing that people care about your voice is very important. And um, I heard that from you all tonight. And I know that the, the position you're in and the things you might want to be able to do, but you might be limited in that regard. Um, what keeps people around in hard times, though, is knowing that they're heard and, and knowing that these issues will be revisited and will continue to be primary concerns moving forward. Um, so I value, you know, those decisions you, you, you have to make and how you're kept up at night, you know, worrying about the state of, you know, our kids' education and how we keep good teachers in the district. Um, you know, I've had, I've had to, I'm, I'm one of those teachers affected by the, by the step restoration. Um, you know, I've been in the district for 16 years. I see myself as continuing the district. I've faced a lot of considerations for family monetary decisions. Do I go elsewhere based on those? Ultimately being heard and knowing your voice is, is heard matters a lot. And I, I do respect that from all of you, because I, I know this is a tough decision. I know you may want to move forward on all those recommendations. And so we'll continue to talk about it in rating because this is what we do. This is the work we do. And, um, you know, I respect all of the tough decisions that you make, that you have to make, but, but definitely hearing what people are saying and wanting to do right by people matters a lot. So I appreciate that. Thank you. And Thank we, you. we we appreciate all of you. Um, appreciate what you just said. Um, I don't think there's a more important job <laughs> or a harder job on the planet. And uh, I used to lay asphalt. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think uh, we 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 do have this, as Michael said, we do have to look at this as as it's a we, it's not like we're like uh, in odds against each other. We do have to look at that like that. And uh, and for that reason, like I said, I, I 
when I heard when I first got on the board and heard about the freezers and all that, I was like, man, I like I don't know how that can be what that can how we can fix that. But however, I do know that we can we could try to never do that again. We can never do that again. And we can never uh we want to get in stay in a place where we we keep our staff. Like we're not cutting staff. And you know, you know, because the budget has to be kept. And so uh, I appreciate what you said. So I've been just um, just thinking this has been um, very difficult to hear, but very necessary um, for so many of you. You've even taught my children and I'm seeing familiar faces and I understand exactly because I'm in the trenches with you. I am um, committed to hearing your feedback and doing everything as a board member along with the rest of the board members that we can so that you can get everything that you deserve and then some because none of us wants to lose another individual and it's very it's very heart-wrenching to hear those things is very difficult um I just I value and support you guys. And so that's our commitment um, so that you know that you're seen and heard and valued. And so we're going to do the best that we can. Thank you. Um, I, I totally want to say this to you guys. Um, This is this is like the biggest decision ever for me because it was it's all about the teachers and the students, um, and I know it's like huge. Um, no one wants to see anybody lose their job. No one wants to see any of these schools be shut down. And I know like what you guys go through day to day, and I said it every day when I was trying to be a board member. So I know you guys are worthy of everything plus more. Um, and I know this is like a huge thing and I couldn't have said it more eloquently than what Dr. Knox said. It. Uh, and I know it's just like a huge compromise and for everyone, especially for the kids. We all know we want what's best for these children and for, for you guys, uh, how we get there is like what we're trying to do. And I know you guys are fighting for these kids every day. Uh, and I know it because I've had these kids and I have my kids. And I know what you guys did for my children. Uh, I'm fighting for you guys every day. I'm sitting up here and I'm asking everybody, like, what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? I didn't went to every board member and ask them, like, how do we make this right? How do we do it? So I want you guys to know I'm 100% how are we going to make this right? How are we going to get this done? Um. And I want you guys to know, like, I see what you guys are doing for these children. And I see what you guys are doing for this community. And I want this to be right. And I think we're going to get this thing right. So I will be around. You guys, I will be more visual. I haven't been in this position, but I will be a lot more visual. And uh, I didn't even know it was a great team meeting. Rick can tell me all the fun stuff. Uh, so I will be there and uh, I'm assuring you guys we will get this thing right so I appreciate you guys and thank you is there a most can I, can I say something yep. I too want to uh, say to the Ray team uh, we're new so a lot of us are just doing the catch up and thank you for the information that you sent please know it was read I, I'm a reader and a writer I'm, you're going to see me up here reading and writing. And when I read, I was like, oh, no, no, no. I was doing like that. Now they need. I was, you know, I was charged up until Dr. Knox called. I think she saw the passion that some of us new ones that don't really know the history. And one-on-one, -on -one, they took her and Mr. Gibson and I forget who else it was, took me step by step through where we are. I needed to know for real where we are. Not what someone is just saying, and it made total sense. 
being a former director at Niles Home for Children who had to work with the finances, I saw it. I saw where we are. And I do not want you all to know, my heart is definitely for you teachers. I was so impressed with the little boy who ran through here tonight and saw his teacher. Mister, he could, his daddy's trying to get him on through. Come on, boy, come on, trying to get him to his thing. No, he wanted to speak to his teacher. That said something to my heart, that these kids love you. And I, I, I used to tell my staff when we had, we were down to bare bones and we were, and I knew we were gonna lose staff because people have to make a living. People have to take care of their kids and it touched my heart when one by one, Dr. Douglas, we're gonna stay. We're gonna stay at, because just to go back and tell the, stu the kids, the residents who lived where we were, that the, the staff was gonna have to leave, they couldn't even handle the thought of that. And I'm telling you, God bless them for staying. So we're gonna work. Thank you. I hate to hear you leaving. I can hear the passion in your voice for Raytown. I hate that you are leaving. And it ain't too late to turn around. <laughs> yes, girls, stay with us. Hang in here with us. But I'm telling all the other teachers, hang in with us. Hang in with us. This team is working hard to make sure that you are going to be blessed. We believe in you. We believe in you. We believe in you. All right. I want to apologize to you because I don't want you to think that it was a character thing with me. It's not a character thing. So hopefully you will receive that from me. Thank you. I also was um, just really interested in some of the things that were mentioned. Um, we have the non-monetary things, and I think those things go a long way in making people comfortable. And just, I'd be interested in conversations with Ray team of things, possibly um, of other things that could be, that, that don't cost a thing. I move that the board, well, Mr. President, I move that the Board of Education increase personal business days, PBD, from four days per school year to five days per school year. 2% increase to the base and one step increase to the salary schedule for the 2023-2024 school year. There's a second. Second. Motion is made and seconded. Mr. President, I just want to say that uh, I'm still fully in favor of the 3% to the base. So I'm going to vote in favor of this motion. So procedurally, I'll be able to ask for to revisit this vote later if we see that the balances are going to be higher than what we think they're going to be. So I'm just saying that, is, that doesn't bind the board to anything. That's just my opinion. So can do that? <laughs> someone who someone who's who votes with the majority can ask for recon vote to reconsider at a later time.
Good evening. Uh, first of all, I wanted to uh, express my appreciation to the uh, uh, Raytown community. Uh, as you know, uh, we recently uh, received a yes vote on a $35 million bond. That's a, a, a tremendous accomplishment, um, a tremendous message uh, to, to, of support to this board and so, or into the, to the uh, school district. And so um, we have Mr. Uh, Joe Kinder, who is with Stiefel. He is a representative of a firm that helps us with the sale of bonds and uh, Mr. Ben Thompson from Gildnor and Bell. Uh, the two of them work together in making sure that we get as much um, and, uh, and that we can and also make sure that process runs smoothly. So they're here to, to answer any questions or speak on this on this matter. Is this on? Okay. Good evening. I'm Mr. Kinder with Stiefel. You can just call me Joe. Uh, good to see some of you again. Good to see meet some of you for the first time. Uh, I know that you have this resolution in front of you and you've had a long board meeting so far, but I do want to make sure that we're communicating with you what this resolution means and what's gone on behind the scenes and in the lead up to this so that you know that even though this is a one board meeting deal and we will be pricing your bonds tomorrow, that this was not uh, poorly thought out or quickly done, so to speak. So uh, usually, typically what you would see from us is this would be a meeting where we would just discuss what we think the plan should be based on your goals and objectives to, to get, create the desired outcomes for you. In this case, we're moving a little bit faster and we have worked as quickly as we can to be able to actually price your bonds and lock in final rates tomorrow. And that's what this resolution is related to. Now, the reason that we've moved quickly is based on some things that are happening in the market here locally and recently. And that is largely being driven by the failure of some nation nationwide banks like Silicon Valley Bank. What that caused in our market was a slight backup, which means kind of slightly lower interest rates and a rising interest rate environment. We didn't know how long that would hang on for. So in the background, just in case you were superstitious, we didn't let you know that we did this prior to the election. But we went ahead with uh, Gilmore and Bell Bond Council and got most documentation prepared and ready to roll for you. This is a process issuing bonds that typically takes eight to 10 weeks. We've got to wait 30 days from an election anyway, so we couldn't have been here prior to uh, May 4th, even talking to you about this and, and authorizing this resolution. But what we tried to do is set you up to be able to act as quickly as you could uh, so that when this market dip, you'd be able to take advantage of that. And then we also see a little bit of what we call an inversion in our yield curve. And all that means to you is, believe it or not, borrowing money out one year is more expensive than borrowing money seven years right now. So we're actually charging more interest on shorter, shorter maturities. That doesn't really impact your ability to repay your debt, but the quicker we can get that money in the door for you all, that sits in your capital projects fund, not in your debt service fund. So those are monies that you can use toward capital improvements. So we wanna be able to lock in rates as quickly as we can in this slightly backed up environment and be able to achieve your finance plan in your debt service fund. And these bonds will only be paid out of debt service. So that dedicated levy is a property tax levy and it can only be used to pay bricks and mortar debt, general obligation debt. You cannot use it to pay teachers or do anything that takes operating the school district. So we know we can execute the plan of finance for you on that side of things, and we know rates have backed up a little bit. So we wanted to be ready for you all. On the other side of that, having that money in your bank account sooner, even as you're going to spend it down, allows you to earn some interest on that for the first time really in a decade or, or greater, where you can actually earn some meaningful interest on that. And I think the number might be a million dollars or so. We're not handling your investments on how that goes, but you might have another additional million dollars to be able to do additional improvements that you may, may not have to do out of your budget otherwise. So hopefully help your budget that way as well. So because we're going so quickly, we wanted to move forward. We want to let you do your reorganization last week, but this is part of a long range plan that's been going on for some time. And I do want to take a quick moment to say congratulations and also to inform you that you probably know this, but passing any election is hard and passing an election particularly with new board members and new cabinet level executives is incredibly difficult to gain the trust of your community. My dad was a superintendent for over 30 years and he used to say, 
these bond issues are a trust exercise with your community. It's something that where you go in and you get a chance to interact with them, engage with them, and whether or not they pass doesn't always mean that they do or do not trust you, but in order for them to pass, they have to trust you and the work you're doing and the administration and the, the tasks that you set in front of them. And you did something that is very, very difficult and you did it with flying colors. And so congratulations on that. That is a big deal to be able to go out and ask your community two questions that will hopefully help you with some of your budget issues, but also help you improve those facilities for your kids. And so congratulations to you all. It's a big deal. I just, I didn't want you not to hear that having been somebody who's been involved in over 700, I think of these now in almost 20 years. So good job, congratulations to you all. Uh, with that planning, we knew that we were gonna be in a good spot to be able to do this. As you look towards your facility side of things, so we wanna make sure as you go through your strategic planning process that you know what your capabilities are. This does not tie you up in terms of what you can do in the future with your debt issuance. We did get really close to your bonding capacity, okay? So that is something that the state limits how much debt you can have outstanding to essentially 15% of your assessed value. We got really close to that number this year. So we've essentially exhausted your ability now to go out and do your debt. But the other limiting factor on, on how, how much debt you can issue and how often is what your cash flows look like in your debt service fund. Now you haven't done a ton of improvements over the last 15 years. So we've got some good room there, but you've also been great stewards of the district's money. And you all are in good shape to be able to not only do this bond issue, pay this off without having to increase taxes, but potentially be able to come back in somewhere in three to five years and go back out to your bonding capacity again. And that number could be as much as 50, $60 million. That will largely depend on what your assessed value is at the time. You will recoup assessed value or you will hopefully increase in assessed value and that will help your bonding capacity and then pay off debt in that time as well. So as we pay down debt, we gain capacity. As we grow, we gain capacity. But you all, from a flexibility standpoint, doesn't mean you have to do anything and it doesn't mean you have to borrow that much but you're in position to be able to go back out even with this debt that you're doing now and be able to come back in three to five years and go back up to that capacity once again when that comes back. So your levy is designed to do that. We in Missouri have these no tax increase bond issues that we live and breathe on in terms of school districts on what they do. And so we purposefully try to set your, your levy and design your levy to be able to do those things so you can continue to come back. So with that in mind, you'll see that I'm going to pass out numbers to you in a second that are hot off the presses. We're going to mark it tomorrow. You're going to see something that looks like what we call a barbell. So you're going to see some payments that are pretty big and a lot of principal up early on. And then you're going to see your payments drop off. And the, you're going to see the payments come back on on this bond issue at the backside of that. That is very targeted and designed. Believe me, you are amortizing principal and interest throughout the entire time of this bond issue. But what we like to talk about your debt service fund is, is one common plan of finance. It's your mortgage, whether you've refinanced it or whether you've taken some equity out or whatever you've done, all of those payments, we wanna look at as one common plan of finance. And the way that we execute a financing for you when we're in a low interest rate environment, and believe me, even though they've come up, they're still historically very low, is that we wanna take advantage of good cash flows you have, positive cash flows you have now. And actually we're gonna pay a bunch of this down almost in cash. You're gonna have a large maturity coming up this March we do interest payments in September, interest and in principal in March, and that's to allow your tax revenues to come in. But you will have big, a big principal payoff already on these bonds right up front. We're going to utilize some reserves that you have sitting in your debt service fund that can only be used to pay that bricks and mortar debt and basically pay that off almost interest free. Uh, but then we'll allow your other debt to be amortized. And then we'll also hopefully free up some cash flows for you to be able to do that next no tax increase bond issue should you need it. And then we want to make sure we're borrowing. We can go out as far as 20 years that we're borrowing as long as we can right now because interest rates are still historically low as we look back over the last 60 or 70 years, even though they've come up a little bit. So that's the plan. I'm going to pass out these numbers for you all. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I did want to mention bond premium. We are planning on issuing these bonds at a premium. And what that means is we can't affect, there are two different measurements that we use for your bonds. The yields are what the yields are. So a yield is essentially what rate, at what rate an investor is willing to pay for your bonds. We actually break your bonds up, sell them off in $5,000 increments to the highest bidder. It's, we'll conduct an auction tomorrow. Highest bidder for you all means lowest possible yield. With that, we, we cannot control the yields. We cannot control where investors are willing to pay. We're gonna use our 350 plus bond salesmen with access to over 300,000 investor accounts to find you the lowest yields, I promise you that but we can impact the actual interest rate that you pay. 
we get to set that rate anywhere in the state of Missouri from zero to 9.99%. Uh, right now, uh, what investors prefer is a premium coupon bond. And there are several reasons behind that that we can get into if you want. But what that means is we're going to set an interest rate on these bonds at above market interest rates. So your bonds are going to go off at about 4% on average over the course of the bonds tomorrow. We're actually going to likely set that unless you tell us otherwise at 5%. What that means is it's a break even for you all in terms of the present value of that, but investors then pay more than face value for that bond. So in order for them to buy then $1,000 worth of bonds, they have to pay something like 1,800. Well, no, that's, that's way too much. 1,080. Uh, if you're buying $100,000 worth of bonds, it would be 108,000. And what that means is more money for you all in your capital projects fund up front. You're not immune to what's going on to everybody through this cost inflation period, as we've seen supplies be short, labor be short, and we know that projects have run a little bit high. You certainly, again, when we do our planning for this, we plan very conservatively. We want to make sure that we can bring you uh, the amount of money that you need to be able to get your projects done. And particularly in these high inflationary environments, we plan even more conservatively on the rate side and hope to be able to bring that to you should you need it. And in this case, we think we'll get you about close to $38 million for construction, so that hopefully you can complete all of the projects that you've listed, and then again, hopefully be able to knock off some more between a little bit of cushion you have there for any overages, and then maybe some interest earned. So that's the plan. I'm going to hand out these numbers. You feel free to ask any questions. The resolution itself, and I'll let Mr. Thompson cover, it's a little bit different. It's called a parameters resolution. It's going to authorize President Burton to sign a bond purchase agreement tomorrow. It's the only thing we need signed on the day of. So I know I took a lot of time there, but I wanted to make sure that I got all of that out. Please, if you have any questions, let me know. And I'll hand these out really quickly. With your permission, is that a, can I approach the dais? 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 Yeah, and, and uh, Ben Thompson with Gilmore and Bell, uh, the district's bond council. Um, I'll be brief as, as Joe passes these out. So what is in front of you, uh, as Joe mentioned, is a parameters resolution uh, for consideration and what, what, how this differs a little bit, as Joe mentioned before, is that there's, there's the numbers are not set yet, right? So they're going to do pricing tomorrow uh, throughout the morning, and then they'll have final pricing numbers. Uh, there are parameters within the resolution um, that Steeple must abide by. Uh, and if, if the uh, resolution is approved and adopted tonight, uh, they, will, they will price using those parameters. And if those parameters are hit, then it, essentially it's a, a springing action where uh, the uh, the uh, resolution is approved and adopted. Uh, at that point, we will uh, gather signatures on all of the other bond documents. Uh, we'll put together uh, the final offering document that it goes out to investors uh, to to kind of give the demographic financial overview of the district. Uh, and then we will also put together a transcript which we will uh, uh, send to the state auditor of Missouri. Uh, who reviews this to these uh, transcript to make sure that everything the boxes are all checked from a legal uh, constitutional standpoint uh, and then uh, once they we get their approval uh, we will close this bond issue on may 25th and funds will be uh, put into the district's uh, project capital projects fund and uh, you have the money there to spend so. mr president may 25th mr president so yeah, Joe, I was a little bit bored there for a while <laughs> <laughs> until you said bond premium. Hey, there you go. Three point four is nice, yeah. very nice. That's more than our pre premium from our fifty million dollar last bond issue. So yeah, that's really that's really good news. So you, you're pretty confident in that. Yeah, th this is the scale we we've been that we went out and, and pre-marketed today. We've been marketing the bonds for about six total business, or well, about five business days for about a week. You're gonna sell uh, them all tomorrow. Where the plan is to sell them tomorrow morning, and we've gotten good reception so far. I did I did for fail to mention that you will be the first pricing bond issue that we have. All the bonds that passed in April, and now I, I said that locally there's some some market consideration as well. We did a St. Louis Public Schools bond here. About a month ago, were you involved? You no, know, was not involved. Uh, and we had it was about a hundred million dollar deal, and we had almost a half a billion dollars worth of orders, which that means that we're able to then lower interest rates because of the interest. There hasn't been a lot of what we call Missouri paper, which means Missouri bonds that carry the double tax exemption within the state of Missouri, come out since the beginning of the calendar year. 
which is a positive, which means there's a lot of demand in the market. So we did, not only did we have a little bit of positive from the national market, but we've got a lot of demand here locally. And so to be the first one out the gate, we hope is a good thing. And one of the reasons that we, we uh, push, push five forward. is more than we thought it was Absolutely. gonna be. And yeah. so if we have that and the interest from putting it in, well, yeah, that's good. And next time I'll try to be more entertaining. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'll be as bored as I can be for $5 million. <laughs> <laughs> so, can you talk about the bond capacity again kind of what the bond is doing the uh where we are yeah so when you, we when we can uh achieve having capacity again so right now and this is just what what looks good to joe kinder just for your planning purposes so you can do whatever you want with this but we project that if the numbers that the county has given us preliminarily are correct for this coming year and we pay down debt. So we, we do have one more year of quasi data. We don't know how that will come in. And then, you know, the next couple of years come in, but we, we've actually plugged in, I think it's a $65 million bond issue in 2027, should you need that. So, I mean, you have some real flexibility. You could do the, the largest bond project that you've ever done in this district still, even with the payments that you've had. Now, a lot of that's just, again, aggressively paying down debt that you all have done, as well as some growth in the community and growth and reassessment that we've seen over the last really three reassessment cycles, which happen every other year. So including this year, about the last five years worth of AV growth has put you in a good spot to be able to come back quite a, quite a bit quicker than, than ordinarily. Yeah. Okay. So tell me real quickly, why are you going to make a $4 million principal payment on March 1st? So you have, so we like, what we like to see is about 75 or 80 percent payment in reserve in case something were to ever happen these are local taxes and again you should have all that revenue collected before your big payments occur in march but we just want to have what we can deem a healthy reserve i think right now because again because of some of the reassessment that you've had some of the growth that you've had in excess of what we planned for i think you're closer to two years worth of payments aren't you jackie in, in reserve. So we're going to take that and put that to work immediately on paying off debt. So we're going to put that, we're almost essentially going to affect a transfer. You're going to get that in your fund for earning money in your fund for and also free it up for projects and then spend that down out of your debt service and still feel that you have a very comfortable reserve, but just spend some of those, I wouldn't call them excess reserves, but some of that cushion that we feel comfortable about. Wow. So last year, two years ago, we had to deal with bond insurance problems in the state. Has that been cleared up? That has. We got an email on about two weeks yeah. ago that the, the new treasurer is no longer going to require that the superintendent sign a certification uh, that she, under penalty of perjury, uh, yeah, <laughs> felonious perjury, whether you make decisions about the health and wellness of your students and Perfect. staff. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So you don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. So we will be in the direct deposit program once again. You utilize it piggybacking on the state's double A plus rate. Thank you. Most. Yeah, we already made the motion. We are we already made the motion. I lost track. <laughs> This is the most. Welcome pass. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you much. we will let you know immediately tomorrow as soon as we know something, and then we'll be back next month. If you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> Very soothing, and I hope you sleep tonight. <laughs> uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Martin Knox, President Burton. Um, we are, 
What? <laughs> Does it take as long as you want? <laughs> Full house. Uh, one thing I do want to piggyback on with, with what Joe said is that this money is different money than what we pay teacher salaries with. Uh, this bond money is exclusively for bricks and mortar, which I think is, a, is something that we need to uh, remember of what we're doing. Uh, what you have before you right now is, is easy. It's an abatement. Uh, currently, we have asbestos floor tile uh, in our corridors. Uh, this is two different companies uh, that we've made a motion to approve uh, to be able to get in, abate the floor so we can move forward with with uh, our construction process. Let's get a motion, then we can discuss. I move the board approved Gherkin Environmental Abatement, Braytown Middle School and Westridge Elementary, in the amount of $97,450, contingency of $9,745, a total amount not to exceed $107,195, and INSCO for the abatement of Eastwood Hills, in the amount of $27,620. With a contingency of $2,762 for a total amount not to exceed $3,382. What'd you say? Oh. <laughs> Motion made and seconded. Any further discussion? Can you add a zero to the Yep. We didn't get the same company we did last. No, ma'am, we don't have enough time to be able to do that and still meet our deadlines. So that's why I split it up with the, between two companies where we'll have multiple crews in multiple locations at the same time to meet our ending. Yes, ma'am. Take your time. <laughs> Motion pass. <laughs> All right. Next we had a uh well, so sorry. I need a motion. Uh, I move the board approved that Newkirk Novak in the amount not to exceed thirty four thousand million. $178,595 for the construction of Raytown South High School Pat Auxiliary Gym and Raytown High School Auxiliary Gym. Motion made and seconded. Okay. Hi. It is. Just, uh, Justin and Sandy are both with us from Hollis Miller. I'm going to go through a little bit. Uh, Sandy's going to walk through scope and sequence of milestones. And then Justin's going to come in and answer any question about hard costs, soft costs. Um, Newkirk and Novak is who we approved is our CMAR uh, February, I believe. Uh, we've been going back through uh, getting pricing back. Um, if you look at the lower you'll have, one that says total bid to budget is the first tab, I believe. Uh, on bid day, when we came in, we came in at $2.6 million over budget. So we had a $35 million bond, bond we were running. We came in $2.6 million over. Uh, we went through some processes with myself, uh, Ms. Cochran, Mr. Durham, uh, Newkirk Novak, went through and looked at every single sub. So your electricians, your HVAC, your plumbers, and went through to where we just delivered the same quality project, but were able to push back on subs to get that price down. Uh, we dropped that price to $1.9 million over, down to $1.7 to $1.6 uh, and we're able to get us under budget. If you look at the sign that says credit for previous uh, paid design costs, there's a credit of 1.3 million and change. Uh, we have been talking about this. This is my fifth year in this position. We have been talking about South High since I have been here and I'm ready to start doing things about our issue at South High rather than talking about it. Uh, so that is that is those previous paid costs that we've used uh, previous bond money for. Uh, we also expect we have our 2019 bond, which we're finishing this summer. Then we're starting our 2023 bond uh, now. So we were anticipating about $750,000 surplus uh, in, our, in our 2019 bond. Uh, we have pretty heavy contingencies in with our summer work. I, we anticipate those contingencies, us not to use the, all those contingencies, that will bump that 750 number up even higher than that. Uh, so the all-in price uh, not to exceed the 34 million 778. It is a lot of money. What questions do you have about money? And then we'll talk through sequence. This cost is going to take up all of the bond money that we raised. Yes, ma'am. 
that's what we that's what we ran the budget when Dr. Martin Knox, myself, Mr. Gibson went to the community and did all of our forums. That was made perfectly clear to everybody that it was going to be these projects. Now, with the with the uh, premium that that Mr. Kinder just spoke about, and uh, the hopefully we won't use all the contingency money that we have built into the project. There will be an opportunity uh, at the end of the project uh, to be able to hopefully do more projects. The, what we run into though is if we would have had the same conversation in 2019 and then look at the sky high inflation. We wouldn't be able to. We, we wouldn't be able to do that. So, based off the facts we have now, uh, we're going to go with yes. We'll be able to complete this bond, and then hopefully have some premium left over to uh, do other projects. Uh, when we talked about bonding capacity, um, we did a, a bond assess uh, a needs assessment that showed a two hundred seventy seven million dollar need for, uh, within the district. We knocked off about fifty. Uh, our last bond was fifty. We paid down uh, three trials at 13 million, I believe. So we really did about $44 million worth of work. Now we're going to do another $35 million worth of work. But this 35 we're doing now is a, it's outside of that 277. So when we're looking at uh, Mr. Burton asked a question about bonding capacity, uh, you know, those will be later conversations down the line. I don't recall all of the things that are supposed to be done in the PHC. So PAC, what was it? Performing Arts Center. Uh, so the the scope and sequence, and Sandy will get to the details on it here in just a second, but we're basically going to build the Performing Arts Center, have it fully functional, and that's a new stand, it's a new building that's connected to the northeast corner of the building, and yes ma'am, and then when that's when that's done, then we'll go through and, and demolish the existing Performing Arts Center and build an auxiliary gym, and in the meantime we'll be building an auxiliary gym at Raytown High School as well. And that will that will sit. It's a standalone building, a FEMA shelter uh, that will be sit on 61st Street and where those existing parking lots are. We're going to go through that scope of sequence here shortly. All right. Motion made and seconded. No. We don't have a second. Have Danny, a would you like to go through a scope and sequence? Okay. There's two attachments. Um, they both have uh, schedule. I thought we were doing it. My bad. Right. One of them says schedule. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perfect. So, um, Good evening, board, and congratulations on the passing of the bond. That's very exciting. Um, as Josh said, these uh, this project in particular we've been talking about for quite a while. So this attachment that's in your packet, I'm just blowing it up here so it's a little bit larger. Um, Mr. Sal Mrs. Salisbury, the, there are basically three projects going on at South High School. The first one is the PAC, and we are starting um, officially next week. We're going to start setting fences. You're going to see signs going up. And there's going to be work mobilizing even before school is out. Um, <clears throat> that first orange section is the Performing Arts Center. Um, it's going to include the auditorium, the stagecraft, the new pre-function and entry. Um, officially, that will be completed, estimated at September of next year. So the idea is that that will be ready for students to use in the 23-24 um, school year. As soon as that is completed, then we will um, start demolishing the corridor between the existing gym and the existing auditorium. That's ideally going to happen, um, start happening next summer, but we have to wait to make sure that everything is ready to go for that. So that'll be confirmed. So I'm gonna jump in there for just a second. We will, I will come back to you with, a, we'll do monthly updates of progress. Uh, at that time, there, there will be a time where I'm gonna come to you and say, hey, we are not done, but we're gonna be done. Uh, I wanna go ahead and go through and demolish the, the existing Performing Arts Center uh, for safety reasons to do it during summertime when we don't have kids in attendance. So the dates on this attachment don't fully reflect that, but that's what we're talking about, again, for the safety of students, if we can get some of that work done. It really has to do with access. The intent here is that that Performing Arts Center will be completely operational while, when the students come back before we demolish the old auditorium. Um, so we'll build back that corridor between the existing gym and the new auxiliary gym. That auditorium, which is sitting where the green square is right now, um, that's the existing auditorium. It's going to be demolished, and that's where the new auxiliary gym will be built. And so construction will basically start in next week, and we will be completed in mm -hmm. June of 2025 at South High School. Josh, you said that the major can sit out here longer. 
Yes, it's for bricks and mortar and not for salaries. Yeah, and I, I don't know what I'm, I'm just a student. So how do we make sure that once they see the building go up, they can understand that this is not money that related to salary? So I think we've done a pretty good job being proactive about that when we've gone into the community. Uh, I've been at countless meetings with Dr. Martin Knox and Mr. Gibson uh, in, the, in the community, in our buildings, PTA meetings, musical performances, explaining those things. Uh, and also I'm in buildings daily uh, going through teachers. I've been this my 20th year in the district. Uh, teachers are not shy to ask me things. Uh, so when, we, when I'm walking through hallways, that's part of my job is to make sure they understand that. Thank you. But, but they also know, they need to know that the second question that we passed so the levy transfer does allow us to put money right. into the different funds that's precisely why we did that yeah well, it's, dying. it's true yeah. okay so this is this is the other attachment that's in your packet that's covering a little bit about schedule. Um, this is the position um, of the new auxiliary gym for Raytown High School. Um, the map is a little bit hard to read, but you can see all the parking lots that are shaded in gray. Just to the north of that is 61st Street, as Josh was referencing, and just above that is the current existing high school. So this will be across 61st Street, located in that existing parking lot. And as you can see, we're expanding the parking around that from what is currently there. So we're going to take some away and then add more. Um, we're looking to break ground on that building in September of this year, 2023, and be finished by May of next year. So the students will be able to use that um, after um, when they come back to school in 2024. So my only question about the motion itself, we motion to pay all this money to no Newkirk Novak. So it's the same as what we've done through um, when we hard bid GC projects. So there's owner contingency in there. Uh, the, so South High, unfortunately, the part that we're, this causes problems, the, the same contractor built the gymnasium that we're tying into. So we par we carried some heavier owner contingencies there in case we run into issues there. It's just the the way the project's set up. Um, it's some well, of the- We are paying the, all the money to them and they're paying the actual bills. Correct. Correct. Yeah. All right. And then the same thing with any change order. When do we have to pay them all the money? As it goes? As, as we do, yeah. just like at GC, as they bill us so. monthly. That is all we have, unless you have questions. Oh yeah, we are working on a ground. We're working on a groundbreaking ceremony. Uh, Marissa and I have been in contact about that. As soon as we get some details uh, worked out, we'll be in contact to set that date. Yes, yep. and we have golden shovels already painted in my shop. <laughs> That's a very important part. That's part of it. Oh, they'll be late. <laughs> All right. Well, ready to vote. Time to vote. Thank you all. Rick, I'm going to say, Rick got off this meeting. Rick got to this meeting. Get back on. That's what I said. I think. Yeah. I thought he was going to say, he got to say his name. Mr. President. Mr. President. <laughs> Mr. President. <laughs> I'm with the Board of Prison Depository Contract and Pledge for Banking Services by UMB for a period beginning July 1st, 2023, for one year with an option to renew for up to four additional years upon satisfactory annual review. Second. What's the main and second? <laughs> Just go to the end of the meeting, get everything. We don't need it here. We're fine. We good. We don't need to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God.
Oh, Surely you can do that, but <laughs> yes, sir. yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, what are you doing? <laughs> What's up? We good. We're not going to even talk to you. <laughs> we good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should have asked him some questions. <laughs> yes. I know that the board approved the May 8th 2023 consent agenda as presented. Second. Motion made and seconded. I'll take a moment to read the donations. Donation of $100 towards the special person breakfast in May from Roxanne Newell to Three Trails Preschool. A donation of $100 toward delinquent student lunch accounts from Christine Lane to Spring Valley Elementary School. Donation of the Big <clears throat> Old Tree Children's Book by Christopher Wesson II from Christopher Wesson II to Southwood Elementary School. Donation of cards for free kids meal or mozzarella sticks for students from Kayla Worsink at Applebee's to Raytown School District. Donation of 60 notepads and colored pencils from Vicki Turbo at the Raytown Area Chamber of Commerce and Tourism uh, to Raytown School District Sparkle Empowerment Conference. Donation of $500 toward lunch and snacks from Surf Pro of Lee Summit to Raytown School District Sparkle Empowerment Conference. Donation of $200 from Danelle Knotts at HCA <clears throat> to Raytown Fire and Ice Robotics at Raytown South High School. Donation of scrubs of various sizes and colors totaling $1,000 from Nancy Durham to Raytown Schools Herndon Career Center. Donation of stuffed lunch worth $780 from Latrice and William Stevenson to Robinson Elementary. A donation of $500 from Smitty Belcher at P1 Construction to Herndon Career Center Welding Program. A donation of popcorn snack chips from Stephanie Castaneda, Castaneda at Sporting KC to New Trails Early Learning Center and a donation of Con Air set, a blow dryer, flat iron and curling iron, which I greatly appreciate. And for uh, and 5.25 Marianne Shears worth $300 from Kim Atkins at State Beauty Supply to the Herndon Career Center Cosmetology. We thank you for all the donations that we're giving this month. We greatly appreciate it and know our kids do too. Let's vote. Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Um, Meeting adjourned.